What's up, guys? My name is Mark Ely, and I was the uh, competitor slash forerunner extraordinaire for this event. Yeah. And I'm Juan Delfin. I'm one of the setters for the event. Um, I also got to MC for my first time ever, which was kind of fun. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And this is my first time doing this, too. So this, this is actually super curious how much later Eric started than Mark. And then is Mark now like, oh, shoot, Eric's going to flash it, right? Yeah, well, like I was saying, um, Eric did tell me... I was chatting with Mark and Eric, and actually Eric purposely would go up to the start, and he would, like, touch it and then back away, trying to psych Mark out a bit, and apparently it worked, so. <laughs> Freaking Scott. Mm -hmm. When he, that guy screams... Yeah, he, he really means it. That was actually his second time up there. And the first time he fell off the hold, and I'm like, oh no, is he gonna do it? Because he needed that problem to make finals. Yeah. I really enjoyed this one. This one's actually my boulder, and uh, I thought it was pretty... It had kind of an uncommon move on it, and mm -hmm. actually kind of stole it from my North Face Cup. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, but, I mean, it's not a move I haven't set before, but it was just inspired by that video that I saw at the North Face Cup and brought it to the comp, and it kind of hammered the girls a bit. Yeah, I think... I, I never obviously never got the chance to climb the girls' problems, but it seems like they were hard and the girls got maybe shut down in ways they didn't expect yeah like that uh well we just missed it but that golf ball on the ix volumes there mm -hmm. oh hey I, I get to be in the video this is pretty cool you can you can watch me get mad at this problem this is the one problem i didn't do hence the is it really? aspect yeah huh. that one was mine <laughs> Well, I, I can blame you for not making finals then. No, it's all Ty's fault. <laughs> he's, a, he's a head setter. I'm merely a pawn. This one was really tricky. This men's one. And, um, well, we, do, do you know? Do we know how many tops there was on men's men's one across both groups? Because they were they were almost the same problem. And I noticed you you guys tried really really hard to make it the same, but it just it wasn't there quite was there. There was some slight differences. Yeah. Mm. Is that even possible to know? How many tops each of them got? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure that out somewhere and Walson will put it on screen for us. <laughs> Actually, it's coming up in two seconds. Is it? Whoa. Oh. Yeah. That's the quality score? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Girls got hammered. That's mm -hmm. a, that was not a... The guys, the guys actually had a lot of tops. Like, four guys with, you know, four tops in not too many attempts yeah you really had to be on your game to make finals this round so men's qualies was actually a huge challenge because uh, we actually had 70 ish men around there mm -hmm. and because of that we had to open up a second qualifier for men's um kind of on short notice so it's not like we just all of a sudden had more wall space so this kind of meant uh First of all, there was top three men in each group got mm -hmm. to go to finals because we didn't have yeah. a semis. And that made it rough for the competitors, for sure. Yeah, and then you guys only had four problems instead of fives in your qualifier round, which mm -hmm. definitely meant every single attempt was that much more stressful. 80 men. 80 men. Jeez. Yeah. So, you can you can withstand, withstand this comment or not, but like, stream A, stream B, which ones are? Uh... You think it was pretty like obviously you try to make it the same. Yeah. It's, that's a tricky question because I, it's really hard as a root setter to put yourself in that perspective of having five minutes on a problem. Um, when we were forwarding all of them, we actually thought the entire round was pretty soft. We were scared people were gonna tie with like topping everything. We were like, oh shoot, we're gonna have ten people in finals. Um, so luckily that didn't happen. So that's every we said it that man. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think I thought they were kind of even, but maybe what group, what group were you in? Mark? I was I was in the A group, and I think after looking at the results a little bit, the B's looked a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the the B's was more you know, reasonable overall. I feel like the 
the A's managed to shut a lot of people down. Either you understood the problem or you didn't. Yeah. Whereas the B's, it was a little more about strength. Yeah, I felt actually men's A was harder in the end. Really? Yeah. So let's break this down. So we've got Robin, Mark, Tyson, Scott, Eric, and Dan. So who was in stream A and who was in group B? And group so B? I think if you scroll Rob, up, we can double Robin, check. Robin, Scott, and Eric were all in A, and Mark, Tyson, and Dan were all in uh, B. Dan actually managed to... Uh, sneak in there after not competing all year or even yeah. I believe the years previous and he just decided screw it I'm going to train for the next two or three weeks and he just that was his way in there so it was kind of neat to see like you know more of an old school climber make finals again so yeah. that was actually that was really yeah. cool when I saw him not get uh, the first problem I kind of thought like oh I guess that's it you know yeah. I thought you needed that one to get in mm-hmm. and I kind of looked away and, and I looked back and yeah, he just he just oh, snuck he's gonna his way make in it. There. Yeah, <laughs> that was tight. The epitome of off the catch. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, so over to women, uh, Alyssa, Eva, Paige, Amy, Min, and Lisa. Now there was no streams. I think we should mention. Um, no, so no there what? was no group A or group B. There because nope. there, yeah. uh, the total the total women I think were just under thirty. Is that correct? 38. 38. That's pretty yeah. good. What's a what's a full round? 50? 60. 60. I, I FSC rules is if you have more than 60 competitors, you have to run two streams. And so for every single World Cup nowadays, they're basically running two streams for qualifiers. Yeah. Great. Okay, so getting into finals. First up is going to be, I believe it's Lisa. Yeah, Lisa Vandeping and Dan Archibald will be the first climbers up. So how the format's going to work is we're just going to show women first, like uh, first female and then on, on deck, and then first male on deck, and just go back and forth. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. There I am. Wow. Yeah. So this problem was actually the very first problem I got on for running. After I didn't make finals, I walked up to Ty being like, hey, I'm for running. We're going to do this. And uh, I think, I hope it was much, much appreciated among the root setters. But this was the first problem, and right away we knew that there was issues because there was a lot of concern about whether the girls could reach some of the movement because, you know, me being a guy over six feet, it was relatively easy for me. Um, so Ty actually made a bunch of last minute changes to the feet, mostly, to uh, make sure that this problem was feasible for all the girls, and I think it was a good decision. I'd agree for sure. Actually, one thing to note would be, I was actually really happy that in both the men's and the women's, um, um, Robin McMillan and Amy Sutton both made it into finals. To me, that's like huge success considering they're some of the shortest in the group. They're both they're both really short, but also really strong. And to give them the, the chance to excel, they were certainly taking advantage of it. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's just fun. Yeah, I was stoked to. It all. It's almost. It'll on, as a root setter. Mm-hmm. It felt a little bit like a validation, you know, because yeah. it any because as root setters, yeah, you understand this as a root setter as well that you get that comment a lot. Maybe yeah. things are too reachy. Yeah, it is. It is far easier to set something that is harder for short people than it is to set something that's harder for uh, tall people. Yeah. So, I mean, I think Ty actually did a really good job of the uh, tweaks along this. Uh, section for making it not so reachy but also still uh, hard to get to bonus. It would have been very easy for Ty to just make a you know a volume slab climb and then all of a sudden you're at bonus which is kind of on the lip just past the salad type. Lisa hasn't got there yet but the fact that you're actually getting a lot of falls before bonus is really nice for a separate from a separation perspective. Yeah actually uh, when we were setting finals, we actually were worried everybody would walk to bonus, uh-huh. and then uh, we would see separation from bonus to the top. Mm-hmm. Clearly, that didn't happen. Um, yeah, a bit because of the tweaks, but also just um, that competition pressure that I was talking about earlier is just really hard to take account for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can you can see Lisa here really struggling to stand up on this volume and really once you once you understand that it's a very dynamic stand up like she committed to it as time it's not so difficult but if you short yourself you're done you're off the wall yeah so i like how quickly she figures out how to move around the bonus 
because that was that's hard by itself. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's kind of hard to do, but if you can, you can kind of picture yourself from her point of view. You can't see anything. There's this giant volume in your face. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're just kind of in this cave and. Yeah. If you didn't sequence this from the ground, or maybe you did earlier and you forgot it, because she's a bit through her round now, um, it could be pretty stressful. Yeah, there's there's a, a chip on the volume on the bonus hold there that she's uh, pressing again on the other side that she's going for, and you can't even see it. You don't even know where it is. So it it actually takes some time to figure out how to get your body in the right position to not only grab that chip but also release yourself. As we, you can see. But uh, Lisa struggled to do that, but managed to pull it through. Yeah, she's uh, she's crazy strong. So I really enjoyed this part of the climb. I would absolutely agree. When I was up there for running for the first time, just wrapping my legs around the volume and feeling secure yet insecure was a very odd feeling. Normally, when you have good hands, you're you're excited, but all of a sudden, your feet are so good that. Um, Hands are insecure. It's a very strange move to do. So, so when you did that, did you, were you straddling that bonus? Yeah, I was. I was straddling it for dear life because that crimp up there before you cross to the finish is not good at all. And Lisa actually made it look really easy, even though the finish was blocked and the crimp was small. Yeah. So, Dan, aren't you bold? Am I saying that right? Yeah. I think so. Everyone calls him Danimal. I don't know if that's more of an old school thing, like, you know, back when you know, there was like the, the C3 comps, the old school, you know, U of A, right beside the track comps. I don't know if it's a thing anymore, but... I think he's still good. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. still, he's still on that. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he, he rolls with it, so... Those U of A walls are still there, hey? Really? Yeah, Lloyd uh, Lloyd King from U of A just showed me them a couple weeks ago. They're no still kidding. there, yeah. You, there's even there's tape on them still. Can you climb it? No, there's no holds. But, oh. Well, I guess <laughs> maybe. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, so this was actually something that we were really I was really concerned as a forerunner, but I was quickly proved wrong. Is that for the taller guys having an undercling with the feet really close to you is actually one of the a good ways to short tall guys. And I was concerned that, you know, some of the taller guys, Dan and Mark Dirksen, would be able to do this move so well, but there was obviously ways around it, so. Yeah, like, uh, what was that? We It was us, we had that chat, right? And it was yeah. like a little mantle on the start. Instead of mm-hmm. uh, holding on, instead of holding on to the grippy part of the bottom of that hold, Actually, if you just kind of press on top of it, on the slippery part, which I guess as a competitor is really risky to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can kind of just press yourself off the ground. Mm-hmm. I don't think any of the competitors did it. They all, you know, just went with a little more body positioning, a little more brute strength. They get that. But even then, it's, it, you, it's still quite the challenge to get to bonus. And you can see Dan's struggles here. I don't think he actually gets to bonus once. So... Give you guys a second to settle in. Time starts in three, two, one. This is uh, Min's first final ever, 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 yeah. That is, that is impressive. Yeah, she actually kind of just skyrocketed. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's she's going with this mantle beta, and I thought the mantle beta was a lot more difficult than the stand-up, and I don't know if that was intentional by the root setters or not. It felt like it was a lot more shouldery and a lot more physical in general. Um, you know, it might have been... Um, not as a team, but on Ty's part, because mm-hmm. setting for comps, um, it's really good to play on the emotions of the climber as well, so you might give them something more secure, and yet that more secure option isn't yeah. actually the yeah. better option. Mm-hmm. Um, when you only have, when every single attempt counts in a competition, 
It's it, hard to play it risky, right? Yeah, it's yeah. hard to play the risk. It's really easy to see like, oh, there's a huge hold right here. I might as well hold that. Like, yeah. I know how to pull down. Yeah. Where really, instead, it's this really dynamic stand and mm -hmm. press up to the stalactite. Yeah, and so this is Min's second attempt on the mantle. And you can she, see that she's very committed to this beta and thinks that this is the beta. Yeah. And it all, you're right, it's very much more secure than the... Uh, than the dynamic stand-up, but you can see that she's so stretched out there that I don't know if anyone's left shoulder would take that kind of strain to hold that position. It definitely looks burly. Um, I guess we're gonna see right here if she's gonna stick with it. It looks like she wants to stick with that beta. Uh, you're, you're, you do coaching, um, mm -hmm. so from a coach perspective, it's, it's key to have a beta and stick with that beta, mm -hmm. but then at what point would you tell your athletes it's time to change the game plan? Well, I, I always encourage my athletes for whenever they're unsure about uh, pieces of the beta to have a plan, but to also have a backup plan. And so either Min in this case doesn't have a backup plan or she's really not um, willing to commit with it. And you can see there that, you know, because this is a slabby climb and not so physical until you get to the bonus and the end of the route, that she is able to figure out things on the fly. So I'm curious what's going through her head for, in terms of decision making, of what beta to try and what really isn't working out for her, even though she's tried the mantle more than once. Mm. It actually looks, she keeps looking at it like she's gonna jump at it. Mm -hmm. She definitely has the skill See, set to do it. That's such a physical position. Yeah, there is, she's, there's two fingers. There. <laughs> yeah, she's, she essentially needs to be on top, you know, on the top half of an iron cross as opposed to beneath an iron cross. And I, I can't imagine myself pulling through that section to keep going. That would be a, a worthy send if she managed to do that. That'd be some crazy power. Yeah, so you, you can see that Min didn't even walk away with bonus, and I think it was maybe that indecisiveness that caused it. Mm. So here we have Eric Sethna, who actually qualified much lower in the round that we would have than we would have had expected. He wasn't able to top Min's A3 because he was in the A stream, and we'll see if he can uh, pull up a few places over the course of this finals round. I, I certainly think he's prepared to, so. It's it's really interesting having somebody with the, the level of experience that Eric does, we really count on him being in finals. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that he didn't, that he almost didn't make finals had us pretty stressed out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, some of the problems are quite difficult as the round progresses, and we were kind of counting on Eric being there for these problems to to put on a bit of a show for the for the crowd. Yeah, if, if you don't have you know a, a competitor, you know you can rely on. It becomes a big risk to set a hard problem for sure. So here we can see uh, Eric's finally got bonus after his first attempt. I was kind of shocked that he struggled with that uh, first section. It's, it's not too difficult, but it's not a gimme either. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> so actually, actually if, if we pause right there, we can see um, that if you go back just one, one uh, just a little bit there to where Eric's barn dooring, you his can right actually right see his, his left foot pulling himself out of the wall, and he wasn't able to keep that in in control and as soon as you have a leg that's starting to flag out because you're off balance you're done you know there's no chance of you recovering from that body position just a, as a point to the viewers watching the dual techs on those holds the white parts are actually extremely slippery compared to other dual techs of I, I felt the 360 dual techs is a little exceptionally yeah. slippery yeah it's it's very much like glass and so we can see eric finally got this uh 
this move now, getting up into the uh, final slab section of the climb. But we'll see here in a second that his flexibility is really not up to par, and it, it really hosed him on this climb. And I think, I don't know if he's been working on that or if he accepted it, but you know, the, uh, the old school alpine knee is really not the solution. Yeah. Anytime I see anybody on an alpine knee, I think, like it's a nice comfortable position to be in yeah. but getting out of that position is, is pretty tough no and that that blocks all that he was trying to hang on to there and, you know it, it's almost useless in terms of that position i believe it's the worst one in that set of holds and so it's really not there to help you yeah amy sutley so i believe she's the without a doubt the uh, shortest competitor for the girls and I think there was definitely some concerns on the root setting side because you don't want to hose her because something physically she physically can't reach but at the same time you don't want to make it so that there's a huge advantage for the taller competitors either it really puts you guys in a tough position yeah when you have that si that difference in size you really want you kind of want every climber to have a similar beta, maybe not the exact same beta. Um, actually, oddly enough, in this problem, I'm pretty sure the, the beta or any variations to it are all pretty similar. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think Amy, I can't remember how well she did, but she was certainly able to, you know, get the spirit of the problem in, and it, it would have been something that was she was capable of, you know, there's no reaches that she were impossible for her or anything like that. Yeah, I do think though it was a little more difficult for her, mm -hmm. this problem. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I mean, she decides height, to go low. Yeah, height always plays a factor, and a lot of the girls, you know, are generally shorter none of them are exceptionally tall mm -hmm. and so it, it it doesn't play too big of a factor but it's still noticeable and something you have to yes. take into account when you group set it. yeah right? definitely for the men's it was a little a, a lot yeah. different. you had mark dirksen and robin McMillan in the same round that's i don't i don't even know what what's the difference in that a, a foot more than a foot uh, uh, more than more than a foot more than I a believe. foot yeah so <laughs> Here, here Amy's going with a uh, slightly different approach than Min to the mantle beta, and we'll see if she can uh, pull it off here. It's looking pretty good. She's actually able to get up on the hole, and this is one of the places where Amy's size actually uh, benefits her, is that wall above her is slightly overhanging, and so a taller competitor is going to be pushed out farther from the wall just because they can't fit, whereas Amy is really able to fit in that space and get a full mantle on that uh, circular clear volume there. Yeah. Anything like that takes so much effort. Um, honestly, I think if she would have gotten the press, she would have had to. She would have had to stay there for a little while just to catch her breath. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm curious to see what she tries next. You can see she's thinking about it, and she really wants. Well, it looks like she wants to go out with the uh, right hand press, but we'll see what sort of body position she's able to get into by the time that she gets there. And that that right there was 100% a wasted attempt. She pulled on and got right back up, and I think that's just a matter of not resting enough in between problems. I don't know the exact timing, but I would say she rested less than 30 seconds in between attempts there, which is really hard when you have such a physical mantle as your beta. So as a coach, would you, obviously you can't talk to the athletes while they're climbing, but would you have advised perhaps, forget about the top, mm -hmm. and let's go for the zone, so rest up a little longer? Well, I mean, it, it's always a tricky scenario. Always you ideally want the top, but there, there is a point where you think that, you know, bonus can make the difference, especially with the newer scoring where bonuses are valued more than attempts to top now. And so in this case for Amy, you know, a second attempt is obviously very worth it. But if she she isn't able to top, then a bonus is the next best thing. In this case, for her, um, it seems like bonus is harder to get to than top. So it might be she just has to let go of that dream 
you know, scrap boulder problem number one and move on and prepare mentally for boulder mm -hmm. problem number two. As you can see there, she did not get the bonus, so it might have been more worthwhile for her not to even put in those extra attempts and just say, I'm going to rest more for problem number two. I see. Scott Evely uh, should be noted as Mark's younger brother. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> we could add the, add the words interesting in there. He is an interesting fellow. <laughs> but so this is Scott's uh, first finals of the year, actually. I know he was uh, disappointed with his uh, the first two competitions of the year. So I'm, I was really excited when finals started to see what he was capable of. Because he, obviously he brought his A game in qualifiers, being one of the, the few guys to top all four problems, but I was, I wanted to see if he was able to carry that A game throughout the uh, finals round. This is such an interesting problem because the beta we had intended for it, we thought was almost too easy. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that the holds are set up, uh, like we were talking about earlier, mentally it makes the climber want to do something different. Mm -hmm. So the beta we had in mind was actually that right hand that he's resting on. Uh, we thought you would get your right foot on it and match. Mm -hmm. Rock up onto your foot a bit and yeah. then push off of that left hand yeah. uh, to rock onto mm -hmm. that right foot. And it, it actually, every time we did it, was a pretty stable move. Mm -hmm. But none of us actually did that as our first impulse either. Yeah. So yeah. it did seem like the competitors might... Uh, go the uh, the harder way, I would call it, as you can see that Scott's doing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think none of the competitors actually ended up doing that way in the end. And even myself as a forerunner, never even thought of that beta. So it's it's interesting to see, to note the, uh, the technical aspect and the trickiness of this first uh, um, section of the problem up to bonus. A lot of the competitors really struggled with it. Um, I myself was able to really just uh, pinch that left hand like Scott is trying here and move across. But obviously, you know, that's maybe not the best beta for all the competitors. Yeah, you could see there he tried to actually change the pinch into just the crimp. He yeah. moved his stem off the dual text just over to the textured area. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not an ideal hand to be pitching. Yeah, and so you can see Scott walked away without even a bonus there either, which is interesting because I thought that the uh, the start was not going to be the technical crux of the bowler problem. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. The top half is a lot harder. So here we have uh, Paige Boxertuck. I probably butchered that. Um, but <laughs> she's been, I believe, she's uh, young, but certainly been a seasoned competitor so far in the past few years, making numerous finals. So it, it'll be, it was definitely exciting to see what she was going to be capable of on this problem. This problem is certainly flashable for uh, almost all, if not all, of the women. So it would be, it's exciting to see the thought process and the uh, her technical prowess in uh, navigating these large volumes. I'd say even uh, as well as her technical pro prowess, we should kind of keep in mind the experience she brings to the table here. Um, she'll probably be able to do any dynamic move with a lot of confidence. Uh, she'll be able to leave those comfortable positions mm -hmm. uh, a lot easier than we were expecting the other climbers to. So as setters, we knew that the top three women, Alyssa, Eva, and Paige, we were expecting them in finals. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that they have tons of experience, so they're going to be able to get through these problems in their own way. Mm -hmm. And then we knew that the other three had less so experience, so maybe we would, we would be testing their uh, mental capabilities a little more. Mm -hmm. So you can see there how she was hesitating and looking up at that uh, stalactite in the middle of the roof there and opted for the mantle instead. So I'm I'm really curious to see if she's willing to switch up her beta um, for this next attempt. Legitimate question, and this is more of a rules question, and it, it usually doesn't come up, but on this problem specifically, uh, you see how it's a four point start on one volume? Yeah. At what point are you started? Is it when all four points, as in your feet and your hands, are on? 
it's as soon as you are off the ground. So there, there's kind of a, a funny little gray area where you are bringing your foot off the ground and you are completely off the ground so your attempt has started, but you have not officially correctly started the boulder problem. And you only really see that with uh, four point starts um, and it usually doesn't make a very large difference. What I really mean is, uh, maybe not with Paige, but if you recall Amy on this problem, she would put an alpine knee on the ball. Oh. At that point, she was not four points on, right? She no, I, I believe on. it is your actual shoe that must be number one. You can't just, I believe on this one, you could try and drape yourself over the volume. And that would be the yeah. He's just still sticking to that mantle data. Mm -hmm. Which is actually a little surprising for me. Yeah, I, I would agree. You can you can see the difference between her and Amy on this mantle though. She's struggling to get up into that same position as Amy, but she might be able to use that little bit of extra height to get her back across. There it is. watching the clock and her like back and forth and then her fingers were so close but the clock hit zero and unfortunately I had to make the call to say time and she was so close in my head I was going in slow motion like time you know I really in climbing you really root for every competitor and it was it was just such a bummer to be the bearer of bad news there Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where Paige's uh, little bit of a lack of experience comes in, knowing when you really need to climb fast, because I believe every girl that bonused the problem also was able to top the problem with that attempt. Mm -hmm. I actually heckled Mark there as soon as he fell, yelling at him that we got him, got a smile out of him. Mm -hmm. You can see Mark Dirksen's difficulty with the starting move in the underclay, and which was one of the concerns when uh, the forerunning was happening, but he was still able to uh, pull it out without too much issue. Ooh. He dry fired off of that nonsense crimp we had up there. Mm -hmm. So that's that's actually a really interesting point. Before bonus was on the uh, the large black uh, blocks volume up and right, and uh, myself personally felt that, that was too far into the problem to have the bonus, and uh, we. We debated about this for a while actually during the uh, process of setting up finals and the conclusion was to put that zone crimp on there as an addition to the problem that wasn't very useful but uh, was a good indicator of kind of the halfway mark um, so there, there was a difficult move before it and a difficult move after it. Yeah I think it was a good move too otherwise uh you would have had a lot less zones on this problem, for sure. Yeah, a, lo a lot of climbers were really unable to do that uh, slab move the next try. And if you look closely here at Mark uh, Dirksen's foot, you can see how he's constantly readjusting that left foot. It has to be in exactly the right position in order to make that slab move work. If it's too close to the wall, you don't really end up in a uh, slab body position, but if it's far enough away, like he just was able to achieve there, then you can uh, almost glide over with ease, which is it's really um, quite the difference that those two inches in your foot placement can make. Definitely. It should also be noted, because the holds are round, the further you go out, if you go too far, all of a sudden you have less friction. Yeah, it is It is a very tricky balance. And so we can see Mark actually being a taller climber than Eric, was a little more flexible and did uh, got up to this 
final move towards the finish with the knees. You can Classic see Classic Dirksen. Yeah, he really <laughs> wants to be able to reach that top from this nice static position rather than doing this one more uh, risky move oh, to get man. the top. But Mark... That's Mark, a spooky move. Yeah, it's absolutely. Spooky move. You can you can really see throughout the comp the the determination on his face to do well, and he really, you know, started that train with problem number one. So being the first guy to send it, it can be really motivating to go out there knowing somebody hasn't done it, and then oh uh, yeah, sending it yourself. So. Definitely, and all the athletes can hear it. They're just upstairs. Um, so you can hear when the cheers go off and someone gets on top and it rattles everyone it's, a little bit. It's, it's actually an interesting game you're playing in uh, sitting in ISO for finals is you can hear the crowd and you can make you know some pretty good educated guesses as to who's done what and you have a lot of time to ponder it. Four minutes a climber, you know, six climbers means you're gonna have twenty minutes rest in between the oh, That's twenty minutes for the crowd, the other climbers, and uh, even yourself to get inside your own head and be mentally psyched out for the next problem. So you really have to focus and be like, okay, he topped it, not get nervous about that top and actually turn it into something that is useful and constructive for the next uh, climb. Yeah, I imagine that would get pretty stressful. Mm -hmm. So here we see Eva going with the mantle beta again and still managing to pull it out. I am thoroughly impressed that any of the girls actually committed to the mantle and were able to stick this move. Yeah, it takes a lot of power. Now we're kind of getting into the top two women in the field here. And really it feels sometimes when we're setting comps, uh, for the women's side, we're really trying to see who's going to win it, Eva or Alyssa. Yeah. Not to discount the other women, but those two are just so powerful, so good at coming in that they, are, they always have a really good shot at taking uh, first place. Mm -hmm. so, and so I think Eva here gets the uh, first flash of the comp almost with no issues whatsoever, which is, compared to the other women, is truly imp impressive that she pulled that off. She gets to try. Oh, I remember I put the chair too much of an angle. I got in trouble here because <laughs> it was because yeah. the problem was facing the the couch was facing the other problems. Um, yeah, the head the head judges are gonna be uh, picky, making sure everything is fair for all the competitors, even with the uh, the extra fun thrown in. <laughs> Yeah, that thing's pretty comfy. Got it. I kind of, I, if it were up to me, every gym would have a few of those kicking around. That'd be amazing. Tyson Martino, did he just get back from his trip down in the States, like just in time for this comp? Uh, I believe so. He's, uh... He's definitely more of an, uh, an inexper inexperienced uh, competitor here. He's certainly made his fair share of finals, but he's still very young and pretty oh new on gosh. the circuit. That was strong. That left mm -hmm. arm lock in there. Mm -hmm. You can see a, a lot of other competitors really struggling with that move, and Tyson decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. He's just you committed know. to that beta, mm -hmm. as powerful as it was. Ooh, he didn't commit there. Yeah. You can, you can actually see how Tyson wasn't able to dynamically go far enough, and there was almost a sense of falling backwards for mm -hmm. him in that position. With that step over move, actually there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first way, which is the way most competitors are going to try and do it, is you push with enough momentum that you should be able to come over that, um, what I'm going to call the critical point, that like yeah. standing yeah. straight yeah. point. Yeah. You should be able to have enough momentum to, to kind of pass through that, stick your right hand out for that lower ball, and have the left hand go up to the blocks volume. But actually the other way is to just have just enough momentum to stop. Yeah, hands free, standing on that one, on that one uh, 360 ball. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly think we'll see some really good uh, demonstrations of that later. Even though Tyson did not walk away with the top, he was I believe the only person to uh, bonus that problem first try for the event, which was quite impressive. 
So here we see our top competitors, uh, Robin McMillan and Alyssa Weber, walking out. I'm really curious to see what they're able to achieve on these problems, having qualified higher rank than everyone else. Yeah. She's a strong girl. She is really good at just turning on that fire for competitions. Mm -hmm. I've set problems for her specifically in mine at the gym before. Um, I've seen her climb at the gym and it is night and day. Her at a gym session and her at a competition like here or at like block shop open. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy to see this girl turn it on and climb really hard. Yeah, Alyssa Weber is absolutely not afraid to commit hard and try hard because she, you can see it, she wants to win and she yeah. will, will do anything she can to win. Yeah, she actually, if you ever get a chance to see her live, um, when she's competing in finals, you'll notice it's very hard to get this girl to smile. <laughs> um, she yeah. is focused, fully focused, and I can definitely respect that walking up to the problem. And then afterwards, sometimes she'll get let, let a smile go. Yeah. I, I the tiger, exactly. Here, like all the Ooh. other girls, she is definitely looking at the uh, fast dynamic stand up and wants a left hand press to shift from her, her uh, center of gravity farther over that right foot. But Did you see that? She almost rocked over onto her right foot there. Mm -hmm. it, it, in in a different you know scenario in a different day, that might be the way to do it. But there there's just not enough. Um, purchase on the wall there and you can see she she falls going for the dynamic stand up because you can, you can pay close attention to her hips and see that her center of gravity is not centered between her feet and her hands in that body position yeah she knows Eva flashed this um she heard the tears mm -hmm. I wonder I would love to ask her if going into this, uh, if that affects her game plan at all or messes with her mind a bit, because she just seems so focused. It's hard to think that it does, but obviously it would have some effect. Yeah, I, I think being, being a uh, competitor and being in this exact scenario where you know, you know that the, the, uh, the athlete in front of you topped the problem and did it quickly, um, it's it really puts the pressure on being like oh shoot you know I'd I'd better do it I'd better not screw up and that extra little bit of pressure can be um, what it takes to uh, um, send you flying off the problem. Yeah. You know it's kind of funny I kept seeing it and I kept forgetting to mention it um, when the girls were looking up to that stalactite for going they kept putting their left hand on the wall. Mm -hmm. And right there, there used to be a sloper, actually. Yeah. There used to be a sloper there that would help them get up. And it's kind of interesting watching them all put their hands at that exact spot where they would need something. Yeah, that was one of Ty's uh, last minute changes to kind of accommodate the, uh, the different walkthrough that uh, the girls now have to do. Originally, that AIX uh, stacked uh, blocks volume there wasn't uh, present. Instead, it was a much worse Delir volume, and the girls were forced to press into the stout type much earlier than uh, they are now. That's a zero attempts. <laughs> <laughs> One top, zero oh, attempts. Back. So here we see Rob, Robin McMillan, our uh, first place qualifier, who actually put on uh, quite a good show in qualifiers, flashing all four problems despite some uh, close calls. So I'm I'm was really excited to see him on problems number one and see if he could, you know, keep that momentum going and excel through the uh, entire Boulder problem. And you can see right away, he's really committed to the stand-up, you yeah. know, a, a flash of bonus, and is right into the uh, um, the uh, slab portion at the end, which is really, really promising to see from him. He makes that look easy. 
See that he does his little hand mm -hmm. hand twiddle there. He does that. A that's lot, the fame. He? That yeah, that's the that's the Robin McMillan thing right there. Little handshake when he's really zoning in on a move. Robin's another guy, uh, another competitor. I really enjoy getting a smile out of. It's it's not so easy. He's pretty focused. Oh, oh <laughs> my that, gosh! That was absolutely insane to watch yeah. the amount of strength there. And Robin is notorious for rushing movement and climbing just a little bit too fast. And you can see there, he got close to falling. He panicked, and that was just enough to send him falling anyways. Because on a slap climb, you really, really have to be pay attention and be extremely delicate throughout all the movement. You lose focus for one second, and you're done. There he is, back, back where we fell last time. See him grimacing. That is not an easy move there. Mm -hmm. one, one advantage as a shorter climber is when you do get an alpine knee, it's a little easier to turn that alpine knee into something that'll keep you going. Mm -hmm. And so you can see Robin actually being really smart there, looking at the time. He knows he can camp out here for as long as he needs to until the time runs down. So if he had only you know five or ten seconds left, he would be much more willing to rush the second this section of the problem. But I believe he had over a minute left, so he was willing to take his time and really figure out how best to approach this move. Look at that backwards two finger grip. Are you kidding? <laughs> Jeez. That was a nice quick send from Robin McMillan. Yeah, strong start for him. And with that, we're done problem one actually. Right out of this kung fu movie with his two fingers back two fingers. That was crazy. <laughs> Ty's beard. Ty, Ty does have the beard. It's the, it's the setter's beard. Yeah. You know, too many competitions in a row, and it just takes its toll, and the facial hair just pops out. Yeah. Oh, there it is again. That backwards two finger crimp. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a hard press to do right there. Jeez. Lisa, Lisa Vandepain, the first woman on problem number two. Um, I know as a forerunner, I really got shut down on this problem. I am a terrible slab climber, and so I was really concerned about how the women uh, will do on this problem. But I think the uh, the root setters kind of kept me in check from you know pushing to make the problem too easy. I I thought it was by far the easiest problem in the round. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad we <laughs> thought we didn't make it easier. Yeah, well, I, I think the the one change that actually happened is that start hold that Lisa grabbed with her right hand was actually a little bit closer into the wall, mm. and it was it was kind of frustrating because you couldn't uh, crimp it as well. It was a little bit blocked, not so much your fingertips, but actually your knuckles. And so uh, when uh, I was talking with Eugene, that was one of the changes that he was really. Um, totally open to making was to pull that little sphere that she's now standing on with her right foot out from the wall just a tiny bit. Just not to make it necessarily easier, but just a little bit more comfortable for the competitors. There used to be um, another one of those binary nines um, out on the left wall actually as a press. Were you there when that was there? No, I wasn't, but it, it was one of the things that the root setters had talked about a lot during the uh, forerunning process in between qualifiers and finals was whether that nine should be replaced or not as an indicator to the girls. But as you can see by Lisa's climbing, she certainly is nowhere near the wall and it doesn't look like it would be uh, a useful hold for her anyways. Yeah. That's a really good volume she's standing on, actually. <laughs> it's a really a, lo good. a lot of the girls were made, able to make it look surprisingly good, even though I, I certainly struggled myself to uh, get to this 
position where she's able to top. And a lot of the girls were actually able to top, you know, super extended fingertips. And I don't know if that's something that you guys intended or were aware of while you were setting these problems. Is that something you thought about? I think that might be a slight oversight of size, of arm length, I would say, because for us it was a palm. For them it's fingertips. It's just one of those things, uh, sometimes as a man you have longer arms and you take it for granted. Yeah. And it's our job as root setters to dial that back a bit and keep that in mind and keep that in check, but sometimes little things slip through the cracks. Yeah. I'm really happy <laughs> they were all able to call their fingers to the finish. Yeah, yeah. They, they all were for sure, which is props to them for being comfortable in the kind of uh, an insecure position with you know, no way of retreating, so. So here we see Dan Archambault on men's number two, which is actually kind of a funny problem. It was one of the, the lesser tweak problems in yeah. finals. There was very few changes, but a lot of talk about what could be changed and making sure that it would actually work for all competitors. So this, this first move actually goes one of two ways I found. If you start it like Dan is looking to start it, it makes sense to do an outright dyno, at least from a forerunner's perspective. And, but if you choose to start it completely facing out, there's actually a little uh, hard to see hold that is visible on the underside of that volume that you can press into, making the dyno a little bit shorter. But Dan, um, he's actually put up numerous uh, dinos throughout the Rockies. Anytime you see like some weird elimination dino, Dan probably did it first. <laughs> and so he is going to go with the dino straight away. Yeah, and that looked really smooth anyways. I think he was got a podium World Cup dino comps. There's That's World not. Cup dino comps? That's... I, so I, would, cool. I would not be surprised to learn that. I, I believe it was before my time, but he did the uh, first ascent of Y-Wing and Z-Wing at Big Rock. <laughs> yeah, which, if anyone has been out there trying those problems, X-Wing is a V7 dyno that is not an easy dyno. Y-Wing is the double hand variation to it, and Z-Wing is the dyno to the hold above it. Yeah. And I know for myself being six foot two, X Wing is hard enough. Um, Z Wing just seems impossible to me. So Dan yeah. is really proficient in those kinds of. Yeah, I agree. Z Wing can, is crazy. Yeah, we can see that proficiency doesn't quite extend to the top of this bowling problem with uh, some of the volumes, and he wasn't able to yeah. flow the top for this move. Can we just talk about Z-Wing for a second? Yeah. Why? Okay, why? I And we were having this chat with Walson earlier. Walson doesn't like to carry a guidebook around, and I think that's awesome. But why is X-Wing a 7, right? Mm -hmm. And Z-Wing... Is just the seven that has like, and how do they put it in the book? Something so, like a little more spice or something? Yeah, I, I don't think Z-Wing is actually officially graded being a full-on eliminate. But I know for myself that it took me numerous, numerous tries to do X-Wing, and Z-Wing doesn't even seem feasible. Yeah. There's actually a little known uh, low start to X-Wing on some terrible, terrible holds which uh, Scott Eadley actually may have gotten the uh, FA of, which is props to that guy. But even he hasn't done Z-Wing, and he is certainly a capable dino yeah, expert. So Z-Wing is tough. I guess uh, boredom is sometimes the, uh, the catalyst in these sorts of scenarios. And you can see Min with a, another flash. I guess you were right. Women's 2 is maybe the easiest women's problem. Yeah. Although I, I certainly am not surprised that uh, some of the guys, particularly myself, struggle at these uh, technical sliding problems that the women seem to excel at. I gotta say, just from problem 1 and problem 2 so far, um, Problem one maybe was a little bit out of Min's experience range, I would yeah. call it. But Min did a really good job with problem two of seeing a problem that she knows she should be able to do mm -hmm. and just doing it. Yeah. You know, um, I think problem two gave uh, women a little too much trouble than it, like more trouble than it should have. Yeah. And for Min, it didn't give her any trouble at all, and that's yeah. 
that's really what I thought would happen for the whole field. Mm -hmm. So here we see Eric able to really use his strength to creating the uh, to sticking the dino on men's number two, and I was actually expecting Eric to uh, flash this problem, but it looks like he got a little smart for a little too smart for his own good, and <laughs> wasn't even even able to come away from the top. And I know that. You know, in, in the competition, it can be so much more difficult because the extra added pressure. A lot of times, finalists will come out and they won't be able to send a problem in five minutes. And then the first go after the comp, they'll send right away. Yeah. And so this was actually one of the uh, betas that I was able to forerun. And I believe the root setters all knew it was uh, possible, but it wasn't the easiest way to do it for sure. And Eric really got suckered into it and wasn't able to pull it out. We'll see here in a second that he'll go up there and he'll try it right the same way again. And as a coach, that's something that I really wouldn't uh, recommend because he didn't look very close to uh, sticking it that way. And I don't believe he would really entertained any other options uh, through that sequence, instead relying on just simply trying harder as opposed to um, some extra technical knowledge through this movement. Yeah. This, uh, that, that undercling there is not the greatest hold coming at it from the bottom, so you really have to get above it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Here we have, uh, Walson with some, uh, phone business to attend to, so please excuse us I actually, for a uh, quick sorry. intermission. I had a huge brain fart there. I thought I said Walson, but it was your phone. It's like, why Walter. is Walson calling himself? Yeah. So here we see uh, Amy on uh, women's number two, and given the experience of Lisa and Min, I would not be, I was not surprised to uh, see another good shot at a flash out of Amy, um, even despite my own failures on this problem. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never live that down. No. But it identifies a uh, good weakness of mine, and I should do more slab climbing. But it is really, really impressive to see the uh, girls excel at uh, this problem. Fun fact, these nines here, Walson shaped himself. Well, you, you, uh, you didn't shape all of them, but you shaped <laughs> the original, or you helped with the process? Yeah, pretty much. I uh, we've been talking about it for a while for a long time, so it was just a matter of getting the time to execute them. Those are pretty mm -hmm. cool holds. Turned yeah. out really nice. Thanks. <sighs> I'm not sure they were used anywhere else in finals, but they were sure, certainly used extensively in qualifiers. And you can see them up on the wall, and the interesting combinations of nines that you can use to block other nines, or there's a, a whole set of crimps that go along with it, that the root setters have used to block certain sections of the holds or use independently, which is really cool to see the, not only the consideration of the hold by itself, but the hold in conjunction with uh, its counterparts as well. It's interesting seeing Amy go for this uh, Gaston press onto that upper volume, as opposed to just trying to crawl uh, onto that second volume, that second pink hold is actually really good as a perch. Once you get on top of it, you can kind of relax. Just surprised to see her go for that beta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm... After the other girls came out, I was certainly expecting sitting in the crowd to really see Amy excel at this problem, but I'm surprised to kind of look back on it now and sort of see the struggles that she had um, throughout the second women's climb. Oh. She makes a prone beta. Mm -hmm. One that none of us really considered. Yeah, no kidding. I believe the intended root setter beta was to go up and left and actually get your right foot on her left hand before getting to bonus. Is that right? Yep, that's right. You want to be perched fully on before continuing over. Mm -hmm. sure. And I, I don't think any of the girls were very keen on that beta. It's it's so easy to get suckered into something that feels more secure just because you have hands on the wall, even though it may not be easier. Exactly. Ooh. I, I remember feeling super tense watching this. Oh, God. Oh. 
That is that is so unfortunate. Yeah. That is so high up too. Yeah, that's she, pretty high. She's she's at sixteen feet. Yeah. Climbing's so interesting because whether you have favorites or not, really at the end of the day, you just want everyone to get to the top, which wouldn't mm -hmm. be a very good comp, but it hurts yeah. hurts my heart. It, <laughs> it does. You want you want everybody to succeed or you know, but not oh. not succeed too fast. You know? Yeah, exactly. And I, 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 f I don't know about you, but I feel as a, a root setter in the times that, you know, I have set for competitions in the past, that it, it is one of the most nerve-wracking experience I've ever had. Way more nerve-wracking than being in finals is watching finals, knowing that what you have put, you know, days and days of effort into is on the line now and being judged by the entire crowd as well as the competitors that are climbing on your problems. Exactly. We get blamed for everything. <laughs> Precisely. So here you can see Scott with some uh, quick attempts on the dino to men's number two with a good stick there. And I thought that he would certainly be capable of his problem too, just like Garrett. But he also got suckered into the same kind of almost, I wouldn't say short person's beta necessarily, but certainly a much more static way of doing the movement. And I almost feel like that is an example of the competitor being too smart, sort of realizing that there's a shorter competitor in the round and going with what they believe the root setter intended rather than what um, might be easiest for them. And Scott is really, really committed to this beta. You can see that he's pulling out a classic Eagle screen on that move. <laughs> and he's, he's right back up there, totally psyched to try the exact same way, which sometimes is Sometimes it's good when the beta is just to try harder, but really when there is other options, it's it's not good to get into suckered into one option. Yeah, it's just so funny because this, like you said, this was our short our shorty beta. Yeah. This was our our beta for Robin McMillan. Um, if he couldn't reach the longer beta, which was yet to be decided at yeah. the time. But I, re I really have to give, I believe Eugene set this problem? Yeah. Yeah, I really have to give props for him to making, for making it such an aesthetic hold. You know, the nice squares, the single hold on each of the squares, it really looked good from the ground. I would agree. It, to me, it had almost a throwback vibe mm -hmm. to older comps in that back then volumes were a little more limited. Yeah. That was the vibe I got from it, and he, he used it really well. It looks mm -hmm. really beautiful on the wall, and yeah, that had that kind of pure vibe to it. Yeah, I, I, I remember um, back on the old, old uh, Chinook bulge, oh, this, must, this might have been eight years ago, um, the first like really volume finals problem was just all these like perfectly square cubes. Um, that I, they just appeared one day and they were made out of wood, totally old school, <laughs> no texture. Walson's giving me the look. <laughs> and they, but from a crowd perspective, who, from people who had never really seen volumes before, they were the coolest things ever. They had all this crazy back plates. And from somebody who had also never climbed on volumes, they looked incredibly difficult. And, um, you know, looking back on that now, that problem must have only been V3, V4, but it was still a finals problem because back then volumes were so challenging, you know, the the cups and the wraps and the different style of movement were so foreign to, to competitors that it, it got falls and was still a challenging problem at that time. So it's, it's really funny to see how the limitations have expanded in just a short period of time and as well climbers knowledge and ability to adapt to these uh, new scenarios that root setters can present to. Also now there's grip on these volumes. Yes, grip is important. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, any uh, viewers out there uh, remember the uh, Vision Climbing Gym in Canmore, that wall was entirely painted with paint and that is it there was no such thing as smearing in that gym <laughs> and i can tell you right now if these volumes that for this women's two qualifier if those were painted with the same texture this problem would be impossible hands down there's no question about it so it's it's amazing how much of a difference uh, texture can make yeah. on these kinds of problems 
you know, uh, just talking about texture, like actually, whenever I climb in other parts of the world, specifically the East, like Asia, their walls have like no texture. Really? Yeah, they're smearing on just garbage slime or something. <laughs> I don't know. There's just nothing on those walls. It's mm -hmm. insane. It's it's shocking how much of a different texture can make, and it's surprising watching Paige on Women's 2 for a bit to see that she hasn't actually gone um, and flashed this boulder. I've seen yeah. Paige do some amazing things with slab, things that I couldn't even comprehend, and to watch her not flash Women's 2 is kind of a shock. Mm -hmm. I agree for sure. She's kind of have, she has this interesting toe hook beta there. Her left foot's towing in on that blocks volume, which is actually working out. It's just more convoluted than it had to be, I would say. Sometimes competitors are too smart for their own good, as we uh, saw Scott and Eric both with men's number two, and they'll actually do a beta that is more complicated than what is absolutely necessary. And mm. Paige and all the other girls are still able to get up to zone using that beta, but it's certainly not the easiest way to do the problem. Maybe this is one case where we get too much credit as setters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's certainly the case. Or the other thing is all the competitors have gone out and sequenced each of these problems for two minutes and then they come back and they're, they're in ISO, they're going to be talking about it. And so oftentimes what can happen is somebody will present a good idea and everyone will adopt it and everyone will try it. And if it works, you know, people aren't very interested in trying something different. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes <laughs> competitors can get in each other's heads. So you can see Mark Dirksen here with number two really taking advantage of his height. Um, he started completely backwards um, into the, uh, the press, which worked perfectly for him as far as I'm concerned. He's a, uh, if he doesn't get his fingers in the right spot, he has a lot of trouble because Mark's a heavy dude and I've asked him how much he weighs and he told me he hasn't weighed himself in years. He's just given up. He's, <laughs> he's heavy, his, his hands are. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's able to deal with it and uh, take advantage of the, those extra few inches where it uh, comes about. I thought this was really amazing beta than Umbar. I didn't see it when I was forerunning these uh, problems and I'm not sure if the root setters did either, but he did a good job. And here you can see the actual you know, kind of taller person beta, which Robin may uh, have been able to do as we discussed when we were forerunning setting, we weren't sure. but. Mark not thinking things, you know, uh, thinking about things too much, but just going with the simple beta, taking advantage of his height, and pulling out the easy top. And you can see that momentum continuing from uh, men's number one, as he, uh, I believe he ends up being the only person with two tops throughout the comp. Yeah. So we've seen, I believe, two flashes of this problem, and then two, you know, girls uh, struggle with it more. I was really curious to see uh, Eva's and Alyssa's attempts on this problem now, because at first I thought it was easy, and then I thought it seemed like it was a little bit hard. And I know I would say Eva's definitely the more technical climber, but Alyssa does have this ability to pull out from somewhere um, this willingness to just climb slab and get it done yeah for real and I believe I wouldn't be surprised that if you guys as root setters were really watching uh, this attempt with a lot of uh, interest to see where Eva would decide to stack up throughout this competition honestly half of these attempts I've never seen because while I was emceeing I was watching either the women's or the men's <laughs> so that, that is a good point this is kind of interesting to see it's like I, some of these I get to see for the first time oh yeah even as a spectator in some of these positions oh, oh my geez, gosh that was so close to it's 
you can see how she really just rushed that last little bit of movement there. She went yeah. a little bit too fast into that right hand volume, and it cost her that attempt. Yeah, her um, hips peeled a little too too much from the wall. But even even as a spectator um, sitting in the crowd, it's really hard to watch two climbers at once and get all the action. Yeah. I've certainly been in so many scenarios where both climbers are getting to the top and your head is whipping back and forth being like, what am I supposed to do with this? Mm, yeah. It's too much exciting information. Yeah, I had that issue, that, that exact issue while uh, emceeing, because like I said, it was my first time, so I was just learning on the fly. You know, Simon asked me the day before if I wanted to MC. <laughs> uh, so sometimes I'd be looking left, he's like, oh, She's getting close to the top. And, oh, he's getting close to the top. Who do I, who do I cheer for? Yeah, it was kind of tricky having to decide which one to pay attention to. She should be able to just get the top here after that last attempt. Mm -hmm. it, what, usually, when climbers are so close in these scenarios, they rarely make the same mistake twice at this level. You really can't afford to do otherwise. And so there, Eva just commits to um, standing on the volume without the right heel hook and is able to uh, match the finish in the same way all the other girls did. Yeah. <clears throat> he looks like he's having a lot of fun, Tyson, in finals. Like, every time... I, he's, he's always caught in a smile here and there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's... He's really good about that, but he, he's also extremely passionate. You can tell when he gets frustrated, his emotion is written on his face. And being as young as he is, I think it's, even for myself um, and older athletes, it can be hard to control the emotions that you feel in uh, finals. And I think that's something that will really benefit Tyson in the future, is uh, controlling that passion and using it to uh, his advantage throughout the competition. Yeah, Tyson Tyson had a lot more trouble on this than I thought he would. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's solely because he doesn't have the same height as Mark Dirksen to do the press. And so when he goes for the, the extra little jump, he can't be catching it one hand. He needs to get both hands on that hold, and he just didn't commit to it in that sense. Um, that... Uh, press hold that he's holding on to right now is really not very good at any angle other than the press. And you can see that Tyson is just not able to hold that uh, right hand with um, with one hand. It just doesn't work when it's by itself. Does he have a pinky injury on his right hand? He doesn't. If you, if you really look closely, he doesn't keep his pinky on the hold. Oh, that time he did. There we go. Yeah, Every well, other attempt, he would go with a three-finger catch. It's it's what it likely is is a lack of finger strength. So as as a coach, I often see this with athletes who uh, are willing, totally willing to drop their uh, pinky. And what it's doing is it's relying more um, on just hanging there rather than being in a strong, uh, solid position. And so this attempt is really worth watching. This was. And it's some amazing, impressive <laughs> tryhard for Tyson. Yeah. I love watching this. That's where the passion is. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. To, to stay on the wall after that takes a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. And the, the, whole, <laughs> the whole crowd <laughs> was just so happy that he taught that problem. And I think he was so excited. Blew his own mind. Yeah. That was really good to see. He's thinking, how, how did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> It, but you know what? How if how many you know attempts would climbers save if they had that level of tryhard? You know how many falls would be saved in those uh, scenarios? It's, it really showcases the mental game that climbing and even sports in general is. Is just how much are you willing to commit? How much are you willing to go for it? How bad do you want it? And Tyson showed that he wanted it. <laughs> Um, actually, I remember having a chat with Joel White once, and I think this is something Bonner taught him, or was it Knut Rockne? I can't remember, recall, so mm -hmm. I hope I'm not just ripping this off of someone and I don't know who it is, but he was telling me that uh, one really important thing for climbing, and this goes for comp climbing or outdoor climbing, is the ability to try really hard 
and then breathe. Mm-hmm. To like switch it on and then relax. And having try hard in that last problem that Tyson just did, um, you could have try hard the whole way there and you should be okay. Some other problems you might want, like the women's one, you have instances of relaxing into the movement, into mm-hmm. try really hard, and then like once you start trying hard, believe me, it's really hard to chill out again, right? Mm-hmm. You almost have to remind yourself to relax. Yeah, it's 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 almost always easier to demonstrate that on a a root climb where you know you'll get through the crux and you'll get to the rest and you just have to breathe and chill and hope you can recover enough for the rest of the route. But in in a boulder problem, it's much harder for competitors to be able to achieve that same level of uh, try hard and rest because it's almost always on a move to move basis. You have to try hard for one move and then you relax. I found this first move that Alyssa is getting on pretty hard to get that left foot up, but all of a sudden she's slab climbing and now she has to relax. And it's really hard to mentally switch those gears um, in order to accommodate what the problem requires of you. Mm-hmm. Climbers, comp climbers always do this. They always crimp volumes. It's <laughs> so, it's so frustrating because they're so good at it. Mm-hmm. You guys have such strong fingers. It's it's impossible to stop you from doing it. You know, uh, like you don't see it anymore. But comps used to just tape the volumes off a bit, or mm-hmm. um, I don't remember any other strategies, but. It doesn't look so nice to do. No, it, it doesn't. And, and sometimes it, it's just a matter of it's really hard to get the volumes perfectly flush all the time, as I'm sure, I'm sure you've uh, struggled with. And competitors will take any advantage they can get. Um, taping the volume certainly was a really good kind of old school solution to uh, crimping the edges of the volumes. And I think the only reason it stopped is simply due to aesthetic purposes. Functionally, yeah. it worked extremely well. Mm-hmm. well. This is having a little more trouble with this than I thought she would have. Wait, so what is the rule? Both holes are okay. So as you can see, that blocks that she's standing on, those blocks, um, volumes do have well, a both so, hole. So for feet, it's totally fine because yeah. you're not going to really be able to get your tone to a bolt hole. Yeah. Crimping bolt holes, whether they're in the wall or a volume, is not okay. However, screw holes are, um, are you know, better and harder to take. But it's really about what the judge can see. If you're, you know, full on crimping a mono bolt hole, the judge might call you on it. But if you're just grabbing the volume and your finger lands in a bolt hole, it's gonna be really hard for the judge to call you on it. So technically the, you're out, but it is one of those rules that has a little bit more leeway than you might expect. And I certainly don't know of anyone being specifically called down for crimping a bolt hole mm. because it it either rarely happens or it's rarely beneficial. Mm-hmm. So just be subtle about it. Yeah, really. <laughs> really. Um, I've seen in World Cups where it's it makes a huge difference is to make the judges' life easier, lives easier, the root setters will actually go in behind the volume and put a bolt in every single T-nut to backfill them, so it's impossible to crimp them at all. And at, at that level, it's it's what you need to do. Jeez, that's a lot of bolts. Yeah. It is a lot of bolts and a lot, and it's a lot of work, but at the end of the day, it's the only way to make sure things are 100% fair. So what about bolt holes as thumb holes? You know what I mean when you're pinching a hole. Yeah, I think I think it's it's the same thing. You know, it's it's extremely difficult for a judge to uh, call you on it, even though those bolt holes yeah. are supposed to be out. However, on a hold, yeah. you know, it's totally okay to mono it just because it's it's the hold. But I think hold companies and hold manufacturers in general have gotten a lot better about. Uh, um, making those bolt holes a lot harder to grab. I'm sure yeah. Wilson knows of some old school uh, resin holds where the it's this big, massive, you know, three foot by three foot sloper or something like that. And the best thing on it was monoing the bolt hole because the bolt hole was a little bit too big. <laughs> Thumb hole size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and competitors took advantage of that. And root setters, you know, eventually tried to block them. You tape over the bolt hole and you stuff something in it. But it's, it was just the nature of things. You know, um, watching Robin on this problem kind of 
shows what we were just talking about that ability to try hard and then turn that mm-hmm. off and relax and geez, that was a good fall um, yeah. if you saw in his last attempt he was chalking up he was he was fully just uh, lead climbing this thing basically mm-hmm. and I think Robin is really really good at turning things on but he is not very good at turning things off his I believe first or second attempt on men's number one really showcased that where he was able to turn things on you know stick the uh the move on men's one with a hard right hand press but he fell right away because he didn't know how to slab switch things to slab climb and turn things off mm. it's a strong dude yeah jeez Vanda Payne starting out on uh, women's number three I think this for running this was easily the hardest women's problems this was oh, the God, problem yeah. to separate uh, Eva and Alyssa if nothing if everything else failed um, and I believe you said this problem one this one's mine yeah um, like with everything else I think I thought the whole thing was uh, soft but this one you're right this one I was like maybe this is the one that'll be tough yeah but we were even talking right before final started about turning this landing hold they're going to, this big blocks one, worse. Yeah. We were talking about making it harder. So. Yeah. And I, I think... I'm glad we didn't. Yeah, I, I think so too. Eva and Alyssa were both able to uh, finish the problem. But um, watching Lisa and the other girls, it was really good to see them get really, really close. And I think if one of them had a little bit more try hard, was able to turn... It up to that next level a bit more maybe they would have been successful but it just wasn't there that day yeah and it was it was really interesting one of the last minute changes was to actually make that tiny crimp a lot better it used to be that slopey crimp at least when i first saw it i don't know how yeah. many iterations this problem has been through but i think it was it was a good decision to make it better for the sake of the girls <laughs> yeah it was uh it wasn't even a slopey crimp it was just a sloper a slopey jib yeah yeah it was pretty bad Oh, that's close. That was close. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think Lisa really had the right idea, but just wasn't able to, uh, you know, kind of find that next gear to want to stick this problem. And I think she did better than almost all the other girls right up until Eva and Alyssa started to uh, climb, which was kind of it was good on her to really show that she wanted it, but it, unfortunately, it just didn't pan out. Yeah, pan out. We spent pan. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a terrible. That was joke. a good Jeez. pan. <laughs> <laughs> so real question. I noticed you pronounce your name Pain? Pat Pain? I really don't know which one it is. I've I thought it was both. Pan, pan. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Real question. I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Yeah. As an MC, this I, is a thing I care about. I, like with yeah, Bakla Shock, every time I was like Block Shock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's interesting. It's it's probably at the point where she's just tired of correcting people and like, yeah, yeah, it, it all goes. Yeah. So, Juan will get it eventually. My my name's Juan. Living in Canada, I get Juan jokes all the time. So, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like an, I feel entitled. Yeah. To this, it's okay. As with Walson. Walson. Winston Walter. Winston, that, that happens all the time. What? Yeah. That's weird. You got this, Lisa. Is that to just top it off there? Oh, yeah. a little more wine. The important stuff in life. Thank you. Oh, yeah, fishing off the bottle. Woohoo. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just get that on stream. Good, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have more, by the way. Oh, wow. So. That's beautiful. Become incoherent. <laughs> I feel like one thing we need to clarify, just in case... Uh, the person watching in case you're like you're new to climbing I remember myself when I got into climbing I watched tons of comp videos um, from around the world IFSCs and locals uh, all of it really so if you're watching this and you keep hearing bonus and zone they're the same thing Uh, zone Mm -hmm. is just a new name well zone is the old name for it and then it became bonus and now it's zone again Uh, but they're the same thing really 
for all intents and purposes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's kind of funny. Be, actually, I'm sure Walson can attest to this to climbing for m- climbing myself for over a decade and Walson for over uh, two decades. Kind of the evolution of uh, three, three decades. decades. Okay. Oh man! Oh geez. <laughs> Um, kind of the evolution of climbing competitions, going back from the uh, old school uh, PCA competitions. If you look on YouTube, you can find some uh, good ones with uh, Chris Sharma and uh, Nels Rasassin, for those of you who know that name. And it's really interesting to compare the styles, not only in how far gyms have come, how far hold manufacturing has come, but also just how far um, climbing has come in general and the style that is presented in, in competitions yeah I, I think it has and uh, it, but it's I like to see how evolved it's become to in such a great direction like it, it could have gone the wrong way and what, what we're seeing now with the IFSC and the, their decisions that they made is really seeing some really uh, great things happen yeah, so that that was Dan with a really nice stick of the uh, momentum uh, run and jump on problem names number three. I believe you said this one. This was also mine. Yeah, and I know myself as a forerunner, I was really concerned about how quickly the uh, guys were able to do it, but I kind of got some reassurance from you guys like no 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 it's fine and the, and the competitors proved you guys right it was a really good call yeah you know what's funny about this problem is i think i said three problems maybe three or four problems on this wall like they were all men's three it's just yeah i said three <laughs> other problems and i remember one of them like ty stuck it and we were like gonna sit with it and then when ty walked away i stripped it because i was like no nah, it's just not it's just not that great. Yeah. I just, uh, with I was never super happy with this one coming out of forerunning, but honestly, after the competition, I'm pretty happy with how it sat. Yeah. It was the easiest one of the round, um, but people somehow still got it in different amounts of attempts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it worked out really well. I know there was, there was a lot of tweaks um, after the run and jump for how to kind of utilize the space to still make it difficult. And Dan ended up being the only one to fall after bonus. No, Dan and Robin were the only ones to really fall after bonus, but I believe, you know, that it was really nice to see Dan pull it out, and you know, the problem was more than just a run jump. Yeah. Which was good to see. Oh, yeah. Dan got a little blood on the holds. Dan got, a bl- got blood on every hold, I should say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every single hold there. Dan got blood on it. That was uh, pretty funny. Yeah, there was there was certainly a bit of a hectic um, scrubbing from the root setters to make sure all that blood was gone. You can see Josh in a second here, I bet, bringing out the ladder to make sure they can get those finish hold, get the blood cleaned off of that. Yeah. So the, the rule with a blood and the way it's gone is if you're bleeding on the wall, the, the judge isn't able to call you off. So if Dan was bleeding that attempt, there's nothing the judge could do to call Dan off you know, make sure he's cleaned it up. But if Dan didn't send that attempt and still had more time, Dan would have had to uh, been able to stop himself from bleeding before getting back on the wall. There is a caveat with, it, with that though. If the root setters aren't able to clean the blood off and the root setters are actually the ones stopping Dan getting back on the wall, then they will give Dan um, an extra two minutes in order to be able to get another good solid attempt in that might have otherwise been stopped by the root center. So it's kind of a confusing thing, but it also makes sense. Nobody really wants to climb on bloody holds, um, yeah. which is why you see Eric and Min waiting here for the root setters to finish cleaning the blood uh, from Dan. And I guess he was able to stop it for the uh, men's four, which is good. It's no fun to stop your, uh, your competition just because your finger yeah. can't take the it's texture. Off the couch skin. Off the yeah. <laughs> well, to his to his credit, those holds are really gritty, and to climb with fingers that are bleeding, 
from at the start of that problem mm-hmm. and to keep pulling all the way to the end yeah that takes a lot of a lot of heart yeah quick quick shout out to uh the root setters you can see them all in that picture ty with the long hair and build eugene with the uh uh dimension volume sweater josh you can see right there with the uh, red sweater and the hat and juan who uh emceed the comp they all did a really good job which was really exciting to see a nice separation Aww. between the uh, competitors thanks mark yeah that was a fun comp that was a really fun comp to set that's a good good group of guys to set it with too should we talk about scoring yeah it's a little it's the scoring system's new it's a little confusing obviously you're an Evely, so you should take this one, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, I actually had a bunch of discussions with my dad, who's uh, been head judge a lot of comps in Alberta and trained a lot of the current head judges in Alberta about the scoring. And what they did is they decided to uh, switch it up a little bit for this year. So it used to be that tops mattered most, then att- fewest attempt to tops, then bonuses, then attempts to bonus. And what they did is they decided to switch the two middle categories there so that um, bonuses, now called zones, counted for more than uh, attempts to top. And what it did is it really changed, it put less emphasis on a flash and more emphasis on at least getting to the halfway mark of a problem throughout uh, the competition. And it didn't, it doesn't really come down so much anymore to who flashed the most problems because a lot of the times a flash really made a big difference doing it first try as opposed to third or fourth try was a huge uh, game changer whereas now it's really important to make sure that you get all four bonuses throughout the competition so that even uh, if you flash three problems but if you don't bonus number four somebody who did um, three problems bonus number four, but maybe it took them 20 tries, will still be ranked a- ahead of you. So it's important to really have a uh, balanced style of climbing, be good in all styles in order to achieve the uh, highest score possible in competitions now. So I think it's by the international community, but it's been fairly well received. A lot of people like it, some people don't. You know, you're never going to make anyone happy, but I think um, there hasn't been any major complaints so far. So. so how do you break down the score for those people that don't understand the score? So it's, it's so it, when when you're scoring now, there will be a, uh, a number and then T. That's the number of tops. Followed by that, there will be a second section, which is a number followed by Z. That's the number of zones. And then there will be a number, an A, and a number. Um, and the first number is the number of attempts it took to get top. So if you flash four problems, that means you did it in four uh, attempts. If you uh, did all four problems second ago, that means it took you eight attempts. So you, the problem that you do send does uh, count for you. So your best score would be four tops, four zones, in, uh, and then four A4 at the end. And so the competitors are then ranked by the order of the numbers. So most number of tops, most number of zones, least number of attempts to top, and least number of attempts to zone. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out um, on a more layman's terms uh, during the Olympics. Mm-hmm. That's going to that's gonna be really interesting yeah, to see. Yeah, the, the Olympics is going to be definitely an interesting topic to cover for sure. So here we see Eric Sethna, and he... He's trying the break. The yeah. break that everybody wanted to try. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And he, he, he's really struggled in the first two problems. He didn't have uh, sends on either of them, which is really surprising to see. But I think with men's three being the easiest, he was really able to give him you know, a confidence boost in the problem and uh, get him back on track to where he needed to be in his competition. Um, yeah, and you can see uh, you can see his experience here. It's not the hardest run and jump move, I would say, but when he does stick it, you can just see how comfortable he is on the wall. Mm-hmm. He just slipped there a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm actually surprised he slipped there. Yeah, I I found when four running, it was really easy to miss those last two feet. Just be a little bit too far away from the wall when you're sticking those, and that's where you can see Eric 
did on his uh, attempts where he fell, but every time he stakes it, his right foot lands solidly on that green hold and secures him in there, no problem. These pinches, by the way, it's hard to see that one he's on right now. These are some pretty thick pinches. They are thick. I, I know yeah, for... Uh, tough to grab. Those are yours? Those are yours, Walson? <laughs> yeah. Dude, those are beauties. Those are so good. I love those holds. They're heavy, though. Yeah. They're heavy. Yeah. I, would, I would say for myself, they're almost a little bit too wide for my hands because I definitely have short thumbs. I prefer a skinny pinch, yeah. for sure. But they are, they are definitely a nice hold. Yeah, they're so awesome. Women's, women's number three again. We weren't really expecting to see any tops out of the women until Eva and Alyssa mm -hmm. came around. Um, so a lot of the women are going to spend a lot of time flailing on this first move to the uh, big kind of double bump blocks there, which is really just about you know establishing um, solidly on that right hand crimp and you know, giving it all you can and throwing for the next hole, which some girls were certainly able to do better than others. Yeah, this move, this this problem has a lot of commitment to it, I think. And nobody actually committed too much to the big move, including Eva and Alyssa, mm -hmm. which I was a little surprised by, considering myself being taller than all of the competitors and having no issues just letting go. Yeah, for for running, this was actually incredibly difficult because of my height. This position that Amy's in, I'm able to reach that left hand. Uh, blocks volume and almost do this move entirely statically um, but adapting you know my climbing style to the way some of the shorter girls were gonna have to climb it meant you know jumping out of a position where you know I could do the move statically but I still had to go for it dynamically to try and mimic what the girls were gonna do in order for the root setters to see you know what would actually happen and I think a lot of the girls really struggled to commit two hands to that uh, farther blocks volume. Yeah, so my intention here was actually to cut your, as your heel cuts, you hit the blocks volume with your left hand and that, now you're kind of in a double Gaston position for just a little bit and then you let your momentum swing you so that you just drop your right hand into the blocks and now you're matched on it. Um, I don't think anyone in the comp actually ended up doing it that way um, because even the list actually had their feet on when they did it. Mm -hmm. uh, their right, their heel hook on, but um, uh, that's just the, that's just one of the things. Setting for a comp, you have an intention, and it's not always going to work. But as long as you kind of create a canvas for the climbers to to work through the problem in a some sort of different amount of attempts, then you're probably going to do an okay job. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's kind of interesting to watch you know all of the girls so far on this problem and how much gumption they're actually able to give it it doesn't really change that much a lot of the girls aren't able to uh, really you know find that next level gear on this problem it looks like Amy just isn't really willing to let go of her right hand and get some sort of powerful generation out of her legs to uh, get over to that block swan and every attempt is almost exactly the same there isn't really a lot of uh, changes. So as a coach, I would try to address that being like, hey, if something's not working, you need to try harder or you need a different beta. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not an overly technical move. And so, you know, if you're going to try the same thing over and over and over and over, you're not going to learn anything from it. And you're certainly not going to do the problem. It seemed like uh, Min was doing the same thing mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, Min was definitely doing it. Um, even Lisa was doing it a fair bit. And, you know, I, I haven't been counting, but Amy's certainly given this six plus tries as the exact same beta. You know, even, even beyond simply trying harder, you know, there is a certain point where it's like, okay, I'm not going to do this problem. I'm just going to rest for women's number four. You know, and Amy is certainly not... Uh, thinking about that you can see her foot's popping she's getting tired she's getting sloppy you know maybe it's time to just say this isn't gonna happen yeah I suppose there's also the pressure of having a crowd at your back mm -hmm. and to just tell them it's like I'm done people watching it yeah <laughs> <laughs> no I'm good 
well, for those people who watched the the last Sportiva Legends, you know, there was a crazy momentum dyna. Chris Sharma walked out, tried it once, and said, "I'm not gonna do this," and walked away, right? And but, was that the latest one? Yeah, that was. Well, I that gotta was, watch that. That was the latest one, really recently. Chris and, Sharma. Mm-hmm. Um, and good on him for being able to recognize that and not give in to the, yeah. the crowd's pressure, you know? That was the Morpho one, right? With the kick, swing, yeah, jump it, it onto was, the volume. so complicated. Dino, drop dino. Yeah. yeah. That was a cool, that was a cool problem. Mm-hmm. I, I was thinking about that problem the whole time setting this comp, like, would that be possible? <laughs> this yeah, comp. yeah. It's, 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 it's incredibly yeah. difficult to make work, you know? Yeah. You Every right setter in the world. The right angle. Yeah. 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 It's really funny. Um, I don't know, anyone watching, if you see cool videos of uh, things on Instagram, like cool problems, odds are your local setter has seen it, and he might try to put it on the wall. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the worldwide setter web. Yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely a lot of root setter pages out there, root setters anonymous, where people just you know you get crazy and you push root setting to its absolute limits of what's what's possible. You know, you you get some resistance certainly of you know just because it's possible doesn't mean you should should we do that you know is this climbing anymore but i believe that's a, <laughs> that's a very different in-depth discussion yeah so we can see scott evely here with a nice send of uh easy peasy three. yeah he did it i believe that second go you know made short work of the run and jump didn't yeah. hesitate on the top at all so uh, good good climbing from him <laughs> a little bit of, of goofy stuff with our, our dad there not afraid to have a little bit of fun so it's always important Oof. yeah i'm really excited to see this thing get some sense mm -hmm. i was so I, sitting I there as the mc in this thing i was really <laughs> worried looking over like oh man i know i planned for just uh eva and Alyssa to get this one but Dang, it's it was, yeah. Yeah, so you, you can see Paige kind of setting herself up for the same sort of uh, trends as the uh, previous competitors. And it'll be really interesting to kind of look at the in-depth analysis of how Eva and Melissa were able to do this move. Because you can even see right away, you know, Paige, when she, her right hand popped on her very first attempt, her heart wasn't in it. She couldn't. She didn't believe that she could send this problem. And sometimes that's all it takes is a little bit of belief that I can actually do this. Mm, yeah. You know? Um, for, first of all, I love, as a setter, putting something on the wall that just looks a little harder than you should be able to do. Mm -hmm. Impossible is usually what I go for. I like, I like things that look impossible. I wouldn't say this looks impossible, but I really love that... Uh, putting something on the wall that has that image of impossibility, but then it's just totally doable if you just commit yeah. to it. Um, aside from that, the point that you were just saying, she didn't believe in it. Um, I've seen videos of athlete clinics, and one thing that gets uh, transmitted a lot in those is that you should just climb as if you've already done the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just Absolutely. you sessioning, like you've already done it. This is like your fifth time doing this problem, mm -hmm. easy peasy. And you have to have that level of commitment when you're doing these kinds of moves, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those of you who have watched the uh, recent Adam Andra videos of him on silence, as well as the uh, one in Real Rock, Age of Andra, you can see how much effort he is putting in to making it feel like he's already climbed the problem when he's going for his 15A flash. And if, if you know, these competitors are able to try the problem over and over and over. But if you don't learn anything from it, you don't act like you have already climbed it, you know, how are you supposed to climb it for the first time in this high pressure scenario? It's not really gonna happen. Yeah. You can you can look at Paige here, at least Paige is willing to try something yeah, I that's what I'll really commend her for. That looked like it was maybe gonna work, you know, yeah, for a little yeah, bit. It was close. She had a Gaston opposition. Instead of Gastoning uh, for the opposition, she would have that drop knee left toe hook mm -hmm. for opposition. That would have been wild. Yeah, it, it absolutely would have been. I think there was 
I definitely looked at it when we were forerunning, you know, was there some options for getting your going feet first through this movement, and they were all very difficult to work, but I wouldn't be surprised if one of the girls could have made it work. Um, you can see Paige deciding that uh, the foot first beta was maybe not the greatest option going back to the mm -hmm. dino. She is able to commit with two hands a little bit better than the other girl, but really not able to uh, uh, stick that move and be able to get bonus for this woman's three problem. This was pretty funny to watch. This is fast. Mm -hmm. This was really quick. Yeah, so actually, up just before Mark got this on, I am actually sitting beside my dad, and I, I bet him, like, I don't think Mark is going to flash him. He's like, I bet you Mark's going to flash him. And then Mark actually walked out and flashed the club, and it really showed how much he actually wanted to uh, do well at this comp. And like, he climbed the whole problem yeah. in like 20 seconds. He was just on. And it's, it's really, really amazing to watch. It goes by so fast. But how much Mark's mentality makes a difference. He went out there and wanted to flash it, and he executed it. And it was really, really cool to watch. You know, um, there's certainly guys that out there that were stronger than Mark, that were technically better than Mark. But I definitely think that none of them wanted it as badly as Mark. And no problem showcased it better than men's number three. You know, fun fact though, about men's three, Mark told me afterwards, um, actually after reading the problem when they were upstairs, so between problem two and three, yeah, he was just up there rehearsing that jump over mm -hmm. and over again. That's why, that's why you saw him run out, put his bag down, like he chalked up and he immediately got right on the wall and just did it. Yeah. He probably could have done it with his eyes closed. Well, maybe not that well, good. Yeah, but. that might be a stretch here. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting to watch, though. Mm, it, it was it was absolutely beautiful to watch. And so here we see Eva on women's number three. And, you know, hopefully we can see a little bit more action going on with how she's able to get to the bonus on this problem. Ooh, toe hook switch. That's a lot of momentum to catch. You really gotta fall into it well. Mm -hmm, yeah, unless you're able to hold kind of that one-handed left arm mm -hmm. uh, lock off, it is really difficult to have any sort of uh, right hand catch going on. It's really hard to stop your momentum from releasing that toe. It's funny, when I was emceeing this and I would hear people cheering in the back, and be like, man, people can yell really loud. I have a mic. <laughs> and I think they're pretty loud. Yeah, Ooh, yeah there see, it is. As, as soon as Eva was able to really commit to the dino, she stopped yeah. it. Oh, yeah. And that, that was the difference between her and the other girls. Yeah. And here's your judging expertise. There, the the zone is on the crimp, mm -hmm. not on the blocks. So this is this is actually something that got discussed during floor running. So the hard move is actually getting to that big first uh, blocks volume, and that would make a lot of sense as a bonus hold. But from a judging perspective, it's extremely hard to judge because a lot of the girls will get very close to sticking it without actually being able to move off of it. And so it's hard to say what the line is between, you know, just flailing on it and actually sticking the hold. And so making zone the next hold makes a lot of sense from a judging perspective because it, the next move is very easy and very controlled. So it's very obvious whether the girls got bonus or not. Now from a forwarding perspective, this was actually a, a very tricky call in my opinion because her left hand crimp is blocked and it's a very committing move and my fingers didn't fit <laughs> and so yeah. I was going down to two three fingers at the most trying to go for this dynamic last move yeah. but I think last minute we uh, brought in uh, Cassie another girl who has very very slim fingers and she's like oh yeah it's fine you know all the girls fingers will be able to fit yeah. so it's, it's kind of an interesting call to compare the two 
Can we actually rewind real quick to sure. women's lead for a sec? I want to show something at the end of the first footage. Yeah, there. Pause, pause right here. Yeah. Do you see there, Josh on the right side there? He's freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's exactly like I said. I was freaking out too, but I was emceeing. I was yeah. like, nobody stopped this thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it's yeah. amazing to spot that. It's yeah, like, oh, like, he's right freaking corner, out. <laughs> it, is, it is absolutely shocking how much more stressful a competition can be for the root setters because you know it's it's this whole accumulation of two or three days of root setting and yeah. all this anticipation you know coming down to like two hours and even one problem you know if the only intention is Eva and Alyssa at the top mm -hmm. you have eight minutes of like oh shoot. yeah yeah <laughs> what am I doing now yeah and like uh, even like reading that root setting book that Jackie Goodoff put out yeah my reading to root setting yeah reading that book and hearing about his failures going into a comp for me I'm like well Jackie Jackie messed it up so yeah there's a pretty good chance <laughs> there's a pretty good chance this one's gonna be messed up mm -hmm. yeah you you have like this world-class French root setter and it's like you know he's he's able to put it a books out of book saying I screwed up and it happened and then yeah. be, being you know not nearly as experienced as you know a world cup root setter who's exactly. been root setting for at least 20 plus years and being like oh dear what am I doing yeah. now yeah, <laughs> it's, exactly. it's extremely difficult and extremely stressful Wow, Ty Tyson just uh, ran in there, mm -hmm. in and out. Yeah, Tyson Tyson uh, was actually practicing all of those run and jumps with Mark Dirksen. You can really see how much it paid Interesting. off. Interesting to note that two athletes were in ISO practicing together. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. I love that about climbing. Yeah, it's it's really amazing to see the cooperation. You know, you most spectators don't get to see what goes on in ISO, but there'll be like full on discussions of like five or so competitors, you know, talking about every single beta. And, you know, with my athletes as a coach, I talk about plans and backup plans and like ridiculous backup plans that you think could never go. And when you talk with other athletes, you get all those, you know, you have your first try, you have your second try, you have your third try, you have the try you never think will go, but you know, one in a million chance it does. Yeah. Which is really, really cool to see. And so we just saw Alyssa stick the bonus hold right there for women's number two, or women's number three, which is, uh, I must, bleh, it must have been really relieving to see for the Yeah, players. definitely. Well, as soon as Eva got it, I was like, okay, there we go. See yeah, if we can yeah. catch Josh again. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's just his stance. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I bet, you, I bet you he was suspense. nervous. I bet you he was really nervous. Oh, will we get him? Oh, he's so, so close. He's so close. Not quite in the frame. <laughs> Not quite. Without well, blame the camera, man. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I have no idea. Robin has one of the most nonchalant faces you could ever have in a finals. Like yeah. he's just like, oh, we're having a rock competition. Do you guys mind if I try? Yeah. <laughs> can, get can, so, I get can I get a pair of rentals? I forgot my <laughs> shoes. Maybe. Yeah. And so this problem is actually a really perfect example of not being able to switch from high gear to low gear really fast. So you can watch uh, Robin either this attempt or a few attempts later actually stick um, the coordination move at the start here as well as the uh, bonus shortly after but he wasn't able to uh, keep his composure and actually top this problem which was really shocking I think he was the only guy unable to top men's three um, which was the which was kind of funny being the easiest problem and then yeah. he was still able to top men's one yes exactly Uh, yeah, we we anticipated everybody would kind of try that that beta break, 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, the slightly more static way. It looks like it'll go off the wall, but then you get on there and the, the angle of the wall just peels you right off. Yeah, and so you, you can see here Robin's given like, you know, four or five attempts already, so you can tell that he really hasn't practiced this move much at all, and he's also not very willing to save attempt. A lot of the times he could have backtracked to the start hold and, you know, tried two things in one attempt, but not really willing to commit to that. I really enjoyed that Robin had to jump to this because he makes it look really good. Oh, wait. Ate Next my own attempt. words. Next, Next attempt. attempt. Next attempt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah, Second we don't, next we, don't know, we don't know what we're talking about over here. <laughs> How did he do in the coordination moves at the mobile top? I don't think was he in finals at the mobile competition? Not sure he was. I don't think he, I don't think he made it. But when when he does get to zone, he makes it look really good. But he's really not able to commit well to moving past it. He certainly has the height capability to get his foot back on that lower left hold and go up to the uh, next guy, but just really not uh, willing to slow down and rushing through this movement. I gotta say, when I was uh, putting this one up, I think I did that move 30 times. Mm -hmm. And I kept moving the target hold further and further. Yeah. <laughs> and by, by the end, I was so close to just stripping it again in my head because I was like it's too easy now now it's way too but that, that's because I did it 30 times but. yeah <laughs> you're right he wasn't that bad in fact ooh strong that's that's not a good hold no and so you can see he gets his foot here and he's just rushing through the movement too fast um, I think if Robin was really able to slow down his movement um, he would have been able to top this problem because you go from a very very dynamic move to watching the other competitors it becomes a very static move movement all of a sudden and robin is still like you know let's move fast let's go hard and he's not taking much time to rest too and you can see by his final attempt he's just exhausted yeah and it, it really impacts his score at the end of this competition so Problems number four for the women. I would I would almost argue from my perspective as a guy and you know a lot of that classic guy strength that women's number four was the easiest problem for the women. But a lot of women really struggled with the first move. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit more powerful, yeah. and a little bit extra uh, coordination required. So yeah. it, it made it made for you know a lot of uh, strengths that became more difficult. Now, it was really cool to see uh, Lisa actually go with this heel hook beta, and she got extremely close on that attempt, um, which was, I believe, not intentional at all. I don't know no. the root setting process behind it. Yeah, for this one, it was um, you actually want to go straight to the next one and come in with the left hand. Mm -hmm. And it should be noted, from this angle, that hole that they're going to, um, sorry, not this one, the higher one there, looks like a jug... I promise it's not. It's it's almost a sloper. <laughs> it's not very good. Mm hmm Yeah, you definitely you definitely need that left hand opposition to kind of help keep you on. Yeah. So and I I think a lot of changes were made to this problem last minute to try and make you know the top a little bit harder, a little bit more tricky for the women. But I think all the women were kind of able to overcome it without too much difficulty once they got bonus but a lot of them took a lot of attempts on this first move which was i'm not sure if it should be surprising and a bit of a shocker or you know that's that is just the way people's strengths play out i really enjoyed this one in that i just thought that the movement in it was exciting for the crowd mm -hmm. which i know is in our number one priority as setters but i was stoked yeah. Uh, the way that this one turned out for mm -hmm. sure. and th this isn't even the intended beta but we just knew that with what they had they were going to have some interesting movement yeah yeah for sure I'm, there was definitely a lot of ways to navigate the volume you know some more intentional than others but it really worked out you know one kind of last committing move for the girls to make sure that they actually really wanted it so it, it's good to see a lot of times on this problem. I think it, it made the uh, 
the crowd happy and excited kind of in stark contrast to uh, men's number four which i believe was the hardest men's problem in the end men's numbers four yeah it was the hardest but i i do think it was the coolest of them all yeah for sure it's just um our men's field is full of really really good climbers but it really needed that Eric Sethna level of expertise. Yeah. For this one, this is almost the World Cup boulder, I would say. Mm-hmm. Not like a... I, and I'm not saying it'd be a hard World Cup boulder, but it'd be entering that stage. Yeah, it, it, it certainly, you know, depending on the World Cup, but could belong in one of the uh, the qualifiers for, for sure. Um, and I remember forerunning this and, you know, saying that, you know, you guys need a harder boulder. And we actually ended up taking a lot of the uh, extra screw-ons off uh, the volumes. Like this uh, this right-hand pinch that Dan's going to used to be worse. Yeah. There used to be a gym on the volume. And then even this next volume that he's about to go to uh, had a couple extra screw-ons just to give a little more... Uh, purchase for the climbers and the way it is now I really enjoy it because it really forces climbers to be precise, know their sequence and commit to their beta but also really try hard um, and you can really kind of see the uh, strength difference between a lot of the men throughout this problem. Yeah, that is a really hard move, I remember that very well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you have to be able to do it, you have to be able to lock off on one arm and it's, it's really just pure hard. But for now, we have uh, men on problem women's four, um, and it, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, how uh, all of the uh, girls stack up on how they were able to do this first move, because that really became the crux of the problem for all of them, is how much power do some of these girls have, and how much are they willing to uh, commit and really want to send this problem. Yeah, this just takes so much grr, this one. Even for me, on I think I was a little tired by the end, but yeah. even for me, at the end, it was uh, a, a struggle to get up this one. It's hard to keep track. It is. It definitely <laughs> is. <laughs> well, it's, it's really... For you especially, you came off setting three days. Yeah. From that correct, and then last minute MC. Yeah. Came in, rocked the house, mm-hmm. and pulled it all off. I was I was really impressed. With I was really done. I got to tell you, by four, by men's, uh, by problem four, I was like, gone. I was <laughs> I was pretty. I was ready to sleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's 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 amazing. Because, you know, you think of root setting as, oh, they're putting holds on the wall. But actually, the amount of forerunning and the amount of climbing that goes in in the days before. The root setters are, are climbing, you know, 10 plus hours worth um, in the two or three days before the comp. And it really takes its toll. You know, I've seen climbers where they basically took a roll of tape and wrapped, you know, each one of their fingers to the point where it looked like they had mummified their hand just to climb and try this move one more time to make sure that it was all right and it's extremely difficult to know the difference between when you're fresh and you're trying a problem and when you're climbing three days on and you don't know you can't even think straight and you're trying a problem to make sure that it works for the competitors it's really hard to get the difficulty right Mm. yeah it takes a lot of work um going back to min though actually curious so you would be able to answer this yeah do you remember your first final what was it like could you give us insight into... So this is actually her last climb of the, the mm-hmm. round. Could you give us insight into like what she might be going through? Yeah, so my, my first final was uh, a bit of a blur because the only reason I made it is uh, a bunch of the strong competitors uh, didn't show up. Um, <laughs> and I, actually, I actually did really well. I ended up coming second to uh, Jason Hallwatch, um, who was completely off the couch and... Uh, um, hadn't competed for a number of years or even climbed for a number of so years. So everything that. was stacked in your favor that yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> so everything was stacked in my favor that day. But I definitely remember, you know, I still remember what I did wrong and what I needed to uh, improve on throughout the competition. But it, it's, it's almost, you know, it's nerve-wracking, but it's 
it's exciting in a certain sense because it's your first finals and no matter where you place you almost have nothing to lose mm -hmm. which is is really uh liberating and it helps relieve a lot of the pressure but it it's also very very hard to execute because a lot of the finals problems are another level of tef technical mm -hmm. another level of difficult and there's a crowd behind you that you're really not used to having so mm -hmm. um in in a certain sense um, you know, if you're able to really let go and enjoy yourself, you can do really, really well. Um, but if you if you let the pressure get to you, it can be absolutely crippling. Yeah, I bet. I I know what it's like to have a couple friends be like, "Come on, Juan, come on!" But mm -hmm. to have a hundred people yell at you like, yeah. "Come on, let's go, guys! All right, I'll try my best." <laughs> yeah, and here I, we go. I think for men to even even get one top is a really good. Uh, a plus for her and you have to start somewhere and you know it it can be devastating to walk go through finals with zero tops but just even having the one is a really com a really big confidence booster mm -hmm. so it's it's good on her to make sure that she got that uh one top and hopefully we'll see her in finals again here we go we, find, we get to see eric doing the really hard men's problem mm -hmm. uh we kind of Eric, kind Eric of makes this look absolutely beautiful. It's yeah, really amazing Jesus. to watch. Jesus. We kind of expected him to be later in the round, maybe yeah, placing yeah, first absolutely. or second in qualies, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you can see on that move the level of control between him and Dan. Eric is really able to showcase how strong he is on this problem. Jeez. And I guess I, I could tell talking to him afterward, you really wish that, you know, all four men's problems were this problem because it's where he is really able to excel over yeah. a lot of the other climbers really around. yeah if everything was the hard boulder that that's basically what he's saying if everything yeah. was harder yeah it was hard enough that eric uh, did get spit off the end here but he uh he definitely was not willing to make that mistake again that's for sure oh yeah, this 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 one arm campus is really great to see. Even after he sticks the right hand, there's still so much weight on the left hand. It's it's hard to imagine how uh, hard Eric is able to pull it off those holes. Yeah, you don't you don't have a lot, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot on these holes. This hold he's holding on is quite good. That swing is particularly hard to hold. There we go. And Eric is just no problem. I'm gonna do this. But I, I actually, from a spectator and a root center point of view, I really enjoy watching competitors' uh, facial expressions after they've done the force problem and when they decide, okay, my competition's over because their face says everything about how well they felt they did for the whole round. Mm -hmm. You can see Eric's right there like, you know, okay, he's happy he finally got some tops in, but he really wished he had done a little bit better. You know, he felt number one was doable, number two was doable. I believe afterwards I... Uh, I went and talked with him, and he still had his shoes on. He was trying men's one and men's two, and he uh, he did men's two right after the competition with, you know, not too much effort. As soon as the pressure was gone, he was ready for it. So it was uh, it's amazing how much uh, of a difference being in a comp scenario can make. He's been out with an injury too, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Feels like he's been perpetually injured for a long time now. <laughs> So in, uh, in February in Bishop, he actually shattered his uh, heel. You know, he, it took him two surgeries. He was on crutches for a while. So it's, it's really great to see him uh, climbing again and climbing strong and able to recover from that injury. I know even after it was uh, pretty much healed, he was having a lot of confident issues, just being willing to uh, take a fall on it um, for fear of, you know, it being injured or... Uh, hurting or whatever the case may be so going back to amy here what did you think about so the first move here watching her get so close on it over and over mm -hmm. i kind of regretted not putting it just an inch or two lower mm -hmm. for her i i think from my perspective 
for running this problem, um, as well as being a root setter for previous competition, sometimes you have to take a risk. You know, you're never going to be able to make everything perfect. And I mm -hmm. think in in this case, the risk was absolutely justified. And I think um, if you look, if you pay very, very close attention to how bent Amy's left arm is, because she's always able to touch the right hold, and she's always able to touch the left hold, but she's never able to stick it. If you look at how bent her left arm is, she certainly had more to give, and that was a matter of how much Amy is able to generate off that move, um, as opposed to it being too far for her to physically reach. Mm, I see what you're saying. I kind of saw it on that last attempt there. Yeah. And so, so sometimes, you know, it, it looks like a climber may be really struggling because of you know some of their physical capabilities or uh, their height in this case but really you know it, it's a matter of um, just simply how strong they are and it looked like Amy was not strong enough period on that last attempt you can see that she she didn't even hit the left hand in a in a decent spot you know she had no hope regardless of whether she was capable of reaching it or not yeah it would have been nice to see her get it though it's yeah. Still a bummer. Bummed me out. Mm -hmm. The whole time but, I was emceeing, I was like, come on, yeah, come on, Amy. At the same time, you know, you look at the World Cup level, how many Japanese girls are her height and they're winning the You're, World Cup, right? I think of that you all know, the time. Like, all the you, time. you bring one of them in here, yeah. you know, you, she might be two inches taller than Amy, if that, and she would just crush this competition, right? And so, you know, you can't, You even as a root setter, you know, you can't, accommodate everyone sometimes they just have to be stronger and that's the name of the game right that's true you know if if you wanted some uh, certain climbers to win you could set four slab problems and it would change the the results entirely but that that's not what climbing is about it's about balance and being good at everything so you try and set that yeah it's, it's very very difficult sometimes So I think I think this this men's four problem, you know, in, in forerunning and talking to the root setters, knew that everyone knew that Eric was going to be capable of doing this, but it, it was really up to the other competitors if they really really wanted it, whether they were able to uh, to send this problem. You know, they needed to find that extra gear. Um, that emotional gear of I want this and I'm going to try hard and a lot of guys were really close Scott was fairly close Mark Dirksen was fairly close um, I actually talked with Mark Dirksen a few days later you know and he said it, it wasn't even that hard a problem it's it's just very very difficult to try hard at the end of the day after you've done qualifiers the rest of finals mm -hmm. um, and so it was it was really there to see if any of the competitors had it in and uh, in just today, it didn't seem like any of them wanted it badly enough. I think it's also just so tricky, that beta. Well, there, there absolutely was multiple betas, but I mean, um, again, when I talked to Mark, he used the exact same beta that he did in the comp and you know, really know. Oh, yeah. Um, Sometimes it doesn't matter what bait they use, you just have to try hard, and that's the end of the story. So, as we can see here, Scott really struggling with those uh, large triangular volumes now, and that's where the, the meat of the problem really, really begins. Mm -hmm. You're very right, you can really see the fatigue on the athlete's mm -hmm. faces. As they hit this last last problem. Yeah, both both it's been a long day. Yeah, both uh, all of the athletes have been you know up for uh, twelve plus hours without question. They had to get up early. A lot of the athletes might have taken uh, a nap in between qualifiers and finals. I know I myself as a competitor often do, and you can really see in these last two powerful physical problems the athletes who are fatigued and the athletes who really want it and are prepared to try hard at the end of the day actually fun fact a lot of them didn't nap on this one the men mm. especially because really? because of how tight the field was for example mm. eric who maybe traditionally would be able to just do qualities be like yep i'm in 
and go. Yeah. He had to stick around. He didn't have to stick around, but he stuck around to see that he actually made it. Yeah. Um, and because a lot of the climbers like to go and eat together after qualies. Yeah. You know, most people were still there. Mark Dirksen was waiting around. Tyson was there. A lot mm-hmm. of the people that made finals were there hanging around to make sure they were actually in finals. Yeah. And that's, that's actually a, a good idea on Eric's part because all appeals, you know, the, the judges are still human. They make mistakes. And if there's any appeals that would have affected uh, Eric's position or any, you know, calls that he didn't agree with, mm-hmm. he has to appeal, you know, before that competitor is done climbing. He's not going to be able to go home, look at the results, and drive back to the gym and make an appeal. It has to be done right then, there, and now. And so he has to stick around, you know, in case that scenario pops up. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you know, the judges often are uh, trained and it's, uh, you know, they end up making the right calls 99% of the time. But it's, it's still a very, very nerve-wracking scenario to sit on the bubble and not sure if somebody's going to push you out of finals or if you're going to be just inside the uh, the cut. So, Yeah. I don't know if you guys noticed, when Paige throws chalk, she'll cover her eyes yeah. to be impartial. Yeah. And yet the chalk still made it to her bolder teammates. <laughs> <laughs> subconscious uh, thinking you know she just knew conspiracy theory here you heard it here All right. I actually don't recall this climb that much uh, mm-hmm. from the day because I was pretty tired Mark yeah. <laughs> Mark was up um, mm-hmm. I didn't even know if he was set up to win or not I couldn't keep track of the scores it was too yeah, w- watching this competition as a spectator you know, we, we knew that Mark had uh, already won before he got on this problem, but it would have been really nice to uh, see him talk the fourth problem and really show that he wanted. And he was very, very close. I Jeez. think in, in this position, you know, there's there's a very short time period where you have to change gears again and really slow down your movement and that's why his left heel blew there is because he wasn't able to slow it down he was still trying to go very very fast because when when you're doing it correctly the movement off of zone should be entirely static Mm -hmm. Um, and you're going from this very dynamic powerful movement to okay let's do this slow and controlled yeah because you want to really stay under that hold, right? Yeah. And because it's an overhang, you can almost stay inside the wall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's amazing how you can just hold that. Yeah, Mark has yeah. some serious... Mark's one of the... He tries some, like, maybe the hardest of most of the classes. Yeah, I, I, think, I think in this case, you know, he had some really, really good try hard. But maybe just not, you know, the best beta. I know for a fact after being able to spend, you know, a good half an hour on this problem for running it, that there are multiple ways to do it. And Mark maybe, you know, wasn't trying the easiest way. He was just trying the first way he kind of came up with. Yeah. Um, and it, it looked like that last attempt at try hard alone wasn't going to be enough to get him to the top. Nice. Oof. Do you think he knew? Do you think he knew he won already? I think so. Um, sometimes uh, competitors will talk about the results in finals uh, before the uh, the competition is done. They won't necessarily talk about you know how many attempts, how many tops. It'll just be questions. You know, did you top that? Mm. Right. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, the nitpicky down to attempts. Um, it's hard to keep track of in finals, but it's really easy to keep track of who top which problems and know coming out to the fourth problem, it's like, if I want to move up, I got to do this, right? Yeah. If Eric didn't do this problem, I believe he would have ended up uh, fifth or so instead of second. Yeah. So it, it was really, really important that he came out ready to pull hard. Yeah. Mark never has any shortage of try hard. Mm-hmm. He, uh, it's funny. He climbs at Chinook a lot, and he'll mm-hmm. ask me like, "Want put something hard on?" And I've just learned. 
I don't think I can. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think well, Oliver and I will be there like this is pretty pretty hard and he'll come in in like two tries, you know? Yeah. I, I realized the way to get him is to trick him. Mm-hmm. You just gotta make him fall off through sheer trickery. Yeah, and and really, you know, at the at the World Cup level, you have to be able to do both. You have to, you know, be able to climb an extremely tricky problem that is also physically at your limit too. Yeah. Even if you do it right, um, and I th- I think sometimes it makes sense to test these competitors to that level, and sometimes. You know, it, it's nice to give them a little bit of leeway when it comes to that, especially for uh, competitors where it's their first finals. You know, you don't want to be giving them a World Cup level problem, being like, here you go, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're at a local, but there it is. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be pretty fun. What if, like, Sean McCall just signed up for your comp there? Like, oh, jeez. <laughs> well, that would be a, a very different scenario indeed. <laughs> Oh, that was close. Mm-hmm. So Eva, Eva really struggled with this first move like all a lot of the other girls. And I think that really just comes down to uh, how fatigued she is, but as well as you know how much power she has in general. I would say that for the most part, uh, she's getting better, but I would call her a very, very crimp-oriented static climber. Um, that's what she's really, really able to excel at. And so... To a certain extent, this problem is fairly easy, but it is also a little bit of her, uh, her weaknesses are being highlighted here. So, mm-hmm. um, once she is able to stick uh, this first move, though, I believe she does top. Yeah, I really like that top section. Mm-hmm. This was, I believe Josh set this boulder, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, so he, he actually spent a long time tweaking the top of this boulder um, in the uh, short time period between qualifiers and finals to make sure that it was really um, interesting for the crowd, fun for the competitors, even um, in the end at the uh, expense of being you know, a hard bowler problem for the women. I think a lot of the women enjoy being able to come away with a uh, top at the end of the round. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's actually funny. Uh, I think he was tweaking it after we all thought it was done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Ty looks over and is like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. But I like the tweaks. I think uh, it was really, it was well worth the extra effort. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. The, f- the first iteration of the problem uh, that I got to climb was good, but it wasn't, you know, perfect. And I think Josh was really willing to put in the effort to make it perfect. So it was nice to see the uh, the result of it um, at the end of the day. So Tyson, can I can I see Tyson's score here? Yeah. Oh, actually, oh, that's the boulder column I see. So Tyson came third. He he just ended up, you know, with a good bit of tryhard, and I think his his top of men's two really uh, helped him out in that regard. Yeah, he did. Uh, he did pretty good, especially like like I said, considering he was just spending a lot of time climbing outside on the rope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's not he's not afraid to put in the effort, put in the try hard, which is really uh really nice to see. So <laughs> you're you're editing slipping. Yeah. <laughs> you you were getting tired. Yeah, it could be. That's so, fine. I th- I think you can you can really see here that Tyson is just getting tired, you know. Um, maybe if he had rested a bit more on some attempts previously or things like that, that he maybe would have been able to uh, have the extra energy to uh, give this problem a real solid go, but it, it just didn't look like he was able to get very far. Yeah. Maybe he needed a nap? Yeah, <laughs> I think they all needed a nap. 
and I know I myself as a competitor, I've certainly gone into uh, problems where I regretted not taking a nap in between qualifiers and finals, and I noticed the difference. So it's it's amazing what works for uh, different people in some scenarios. So what is the nap strategy? Um, what's, what's the best nap strategy? So. For me, you know, there's a whole bunch of sleep studies that have gone on and stuff, but I like to take like a full on hour and a half nap um, and then finish that nap uh, two hours before I actually have to walk into ISO. So it gives me time to, you know, wake up. I'm a super groggy person when I wake up. Believe me, you don't want to <laughs> be around me. <laughs> um and then, you know, I have the chance to eat dinner and then, you know, walk into ISO, climb, uh, and uh, prepare for the competition. It, it's, it's nice to be able to take that mindset um, and give that mindset time to, you know, really get myself focused. Um, I know Alyssa Weber for sure took a nap in between competitions and she ended up winning i mean she was certainly capable it wasn't as if a nap you know was all of the effort but it, it can help um it's amazing how much even you know a 20 minute 30 minute nap can do for you so yeah i've heard that 30 minutes is like mm -hmm. yeah the the, the the best times is like if you set if you're gonna take a short nap set yourself an alarm for half an hour and try and wake up before your alarm um if you're gonna take a long nap set yourself an alarm for an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes and try and wake up before your alarm again. It's, I don't know the whole science behind it, but it's just based on your sleep patterns. So th this, this problem, Women's Floor, was actually really nice to uh, watch Alyssa on. It really showcased her uh, strengths. She just walked up and did it. That's, that's about it. There was no funny business. There was no fussing around. Just... I'm going to win. <laughs> um, and I, th I think actually for the uh, root setters, when I was talking to them, they were pretty worried because I think Alyssa and Eva were very, very close up to this point. They both had three uh, tops in almost or exactly the same number of attempts. And uh, this problem really separated Alyssa and Eva, um, even though Women's 3 was supposed to do that, in that Alyssa flashed it and Eva took a number of tries to stick the first move. So I'm sure that was yeah, a, this was a nice. major relief. <laughs> they went into this tie, yeah. yeah. I didn't know at the time, but I heard, and I'm glad the way it worked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always nice when it works out. Easy peasy. Shampoo squeezy. <laughs> Never heard that rendition. What? <laughs> Easy peasy shampoo squeezy? No. This is a really cool shot. Like you kind of get how packed the gym is, like the arch in the back. I, it was kind of weird because we, we didn't really get a count on the, the spectators over there, but it, I think it's because it's so large. We're so we used to squeezing in spectators. Yeah, and, and Chinook. <laughs> so we weren't yeah. sure if it was less spectators than normal or just because it, it was a good group. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It felt like yeah. a good size. It would be even, even more when you guys host provincials, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Oh, oh, nice. We ran out of water. You got a little bit of time. Isn't that a... Uh, there is provincial. That's to be determined. So it's right? to be determined. I think the ACA really wanted blocks. Yeah. But they're not going to get blocks. Why not? Because so, they're they're pretty adamant to build their new business. They're not going to do it. Oh, okay. I think it's a good call. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure someone's going to stop. Yeah. It's a nice gym. If you haven't been to blocks yet, I recommend it. Pretty fun. It's, it's, it's a very nice gym in Edmund. Edmonton for sure. Owners owners are great and the root setting is really, really good and it's just a nice space overall. So there's the plug, Selena. She didn't yeah. ask for one. <laughs> you didn't ask for one, but you got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this this on Robin on number four, you know, he's certainly strong enough to do this boulder problem, but you can really see his right foot there popping. He's just rushing it, he's tired, he just he doesn't want it. And he, he hasn't set himself up for success over the round. You know, he did number one, and that's after that he was done. 
to one has the comp in general. Yeah. How do you how do you feel? How how I thought it went really well actually. Um we talked a lot about the behind the scenes and the kind of concerns we had going into it. But take all that away and just like success or failure wise for the comp, I'd say great success. If you look at the women's round, I think it was four four three two one four four three two one zero, right for tops, which is like a pretty amazing separation. Mm-hmm. And for the men's, uh, we separated them exactly how we wanted them to be, which is like a really robotic way of me to say uh, the comp went well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the the men, you know, every problem got topped, but nobody topped every problem. You know, it's almost like an ideal scenario. Yeah, that everyone, was interesting. Everyone was able to excel in their own way, and it was it really came down to who could excel in the most, uh, in the largest variety. That's actually one of the things I like the most is that I couldn't keep track because I was on the mats the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause, and it was hard to keep track because somebody would send like problem one and then not send problem two and then vice versa. And it was just, I to me, I thought they were all tied or something. I had no clue going into the fourth problem. It'd be nice to get a, a real time so yeah, no, I gotta say, someone brought it up to my attention. This, this comp, uh, I've realized that we've done about 100 comps in the past two decades. And I gotta say, this is my top 20. Really? Yeah, I think it went well. You we had a good team. Good comp. Thanks. Thanks. Walson's telling us it went good. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> a lot of comps yeah jeez yeah yeah well i know myself when i started about a decade ago there was the old uh, c3 competitions you know let's let's host a three-hour scramble on a friday night have a have a, a mini slack line competition with some uh, <laughs> some gorgeous face plants from those who had never slack lined before while results were tallying and then a little prizes yeah and then before i was around there was the ferocious comps walson yeah. ferocious comps yep and uh we'd we'd even do um after work friday comps so <laughs> it, the, the intent was just to walk in with a suit and tie those mm-hmm. guys from downtown working suit and tie and johnny Hag and those dave Dorn would come in and compete <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so, climbing's come on. it's a different world now hey it, it is it's nice to see Maybe this is a question for you, actually, mm-hmm. being an Evely. And you, you got the in, or at least your ear to the ground for the ACA a bit. Mm-hmm. Do you think they'll ever start enforcing semis? I, I think as, as the sport grows, um, it, we'll have to. We'll start seeing the number of competitors. Um, this competition ran two rounds for the men. Um, and, you know, with that number of competitors, there is room to be a semis. Um, you, the IFSC World Cup standard for semis is 20 competitors, and if we held semis for this comp for the men, it would have cut down, you know, 50 plus competitors, which is still an extremely large volume. Um, will they ever enforce it? That's that's a discussion that has to come with the gyms, because all of a sudden you're forced to add an extra day to the competition, an extra day of setting, an extra day of shutdown. It really adds up. Um, but for uh, larger competitions, provincials and nationals, you know, nationals, it's already a thing. Um, for provincials, I could definitely see it start to happen in mm-hmm. the next uh, few years. You know, if you look at the, the way the IFSC go- is um, going, the way the U.S. is going, the way Europe's going, you know, climbing is getting more popular and more people are going to register um, for the youth competitions alone this year. They've had almost every competition fill up for almost every age category. They've had to actually add competitions last minute during the year because competitors weren't able to register for competition to get their points to qualify for um, additional events because they were just full. Yeah. So it's, it's going to head that way sooner or later, and it's coming fast. That'll be definitely fun to set. Think about it, right? have qualies and semis to separate your climbers and then you have finals to like put on this crazy show still separate them but like mm-hmm. 
big make showy it, boulders, you know? Yeah, se- having semis is a lot less uh, stressful on the root setters, that is for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you get that count back. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, count back's kind of lame, but still, it's there. It's You, you have a, a much better security blanket. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Mark, you're welcome. Juan. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's great. Uh, it's great breaking down the comp, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks again.